So the webinar is open and live stream is going. Uh, it's 801, I think you're going to start going. Okay. Hello and uh, welcome everyone to the first day of talks in the CINCEL 2021 uh, conference. Um, CINCEL 2021 is short for the International Conference on Engineering Synthetic Cells and Organelles. Um, I'm your host for the first session um, and moderating, we'll be moderating the first session. My name is Gabriel P. Lopez. I'm a professor of chemical and biological engineering at the University of New Mexican, Mexico. Uh, thanks very much for joining. Uh, I want to begin by just giving you a little bit of history uh, about uh, this conference. Um, really the, uh, the story goes back uh, now almost uh, three years. Um, the idea for the conference originated uh, during a visit of Michael Gruns uh, to the University of New Mexico. Uh, Michael was there recruiting for the brand new Matter to Life program that the Max Planck Society was uh, kicking off um, during that time. And um, we, we came up with the idea to submit a proposal to the NSF to um, to host this conference and to try to bring together um, the, the leaders that were engaging in synthetic cell technology around the world. Um, so I, I worked with him, uh, with uh, Joachim Spatz, who is the director of the Max Planck School Matter to Life uh, on my colleagues, Andy Shreve and Darko Stefanovic on this NSF proposal. And we were funded as part of the NSF's Rules of Life program. Uh, the, the idea was to have this conference in uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico in, in May or June of 2020. Um, we, cho we chose Santa Fe, not only because it's, it's near UNM, but also because it's a renowned destination for culture and arts and good food, uh, as well as uh, being a, a fantastic place geographically. So we, we thought it would be a good draw. Um, for people from around the world to come and, and join. And we got a lot of interest. And, and we also, uh, not only from people who wanted to participate, but also from uh, additional sponsors. So the additional sponsors that we garnered um, support from included, included the University of New Mexico, uh, Max Planck School Matter to Life, NSF, uh, the New Mexico Consortium, uh, Los Alamos National Laboratory, and Build a Cell as well. Um, and so we were all set to go, um, and, but um, in the spring of 2020, we had to make a difficult decision that we would cancel the in-person conference and 
this was the right decision uh, as um, New Mexico shut down completely um, very shortly after, um, after we made the decision. And so we were not able to meet in person in May 2020, um, but we were able to uh, have an initial virtual meeting last, last year. Um, and this, this was a short three-day meeting, uh, CINCEL, what we called CINCEL 2020. And um, it included uh, very nice program overviews from the various uh, coordinated efforts um, in the US and Europe to build um, a synthetic cell technology, including Matter to Life, Build a Cell, and, and BASIC. We also had several very good tutorial lectures on um, synthetic cells and synthetic organelles. And we had a special panel discussion on the applic potential application of synthetic cell technology to pandetic, pandemic mitigation. Um, so um, some of these talks are still uh, online if you are interested, um, they're, they're great talks. Um, so at that time, you know, we still had hopes that we might be able to pull off an in-person conference in 2021. That was our plan. Um, unfortunately, um, we were not able to do this. The pandemic uh, dragged on. And so we made the decision to try to uh, be able to deliver all of the, um, uh, all of the content that, uh, Telmo, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, sorry, for some reason I'm seeing your, your uh, box. So we, we made a decision to try and de de deliver all of the content we had originally planned uh, virtually. And so uh, starting in January, we worked with Build a Cell to uh, have um, speakers who are scheduled to present to, in SinCell as part of their speaker series. And we, we did this all through the spring semester. And, and again, many of those talks are available on our YouTube channel. And then um, we, we kicked off this conference uh, with a poster session uh, last night. And it was a very nice poster session. Uh, we had uh, very hearty discussions and, um, and um, there was really some really nice talk, really nice talks and posters uh, presented. So, uh, so we, we continue today um, with uh, the first day of talks, and uh, here is the schedule for today, a great series of talks. And again, there at the end, uh, there will be an hour available for meeting with the posters, uh, presenters. And again, I very much encourage you to do that. Um, there's lots of, of good uh, research uh, being presented, and, and we have some very, um, very fine researchers presenting it. Um, tomorrow, we will continue with, with more uh, talks. Some, again, a, another great lineup of speakers. And at the end, uh, we will have some um, lightning presentations from the uh, posters presenters that were judged to uh, have the best posters. Um, and so there will be four uh, short talks. These are the poster contest winners. Um, uh, we have, we will have very nice talks then at the end of uh, the day tomorrow. And again, I, I encourage you to visit our, our poster website where you can see the posters and also see short introductions from all of the poster presenters um, and then to join uh, on these lightning presentations from these four uh, young researchers. Um, so um, on Friday, um, we will have uh, a workshop that will include uh, some of the um, early career um, speakers and some of the very well-established speakers of uh, the, the program directors from um, Build a Cell, from Matter to Life, and from BASIC. Um, um, and the idea is to try to talk about the potential future of this type of activity um, for on a, on a global scale. And um, we'll see what comes out of that. Um, I, I'm very much looking forward to uh, seeing what uh, the postdocs and graduate students who spoke at our um, seminar series and conference uh, have to say about their thoughts about the future. That will be quite interesting. Um, 
So uh, I just want to wrap up here by acknowledging um, the funding again that we got and the, the many people who worked on this, including those folks on the UNM staff. There was a lot of support from UNM. Um, and we also had a very uh, good and active organizing committee. And then finally, I'd like to just like to thank, thank the speakers, the panelists, the moderators, and the poster presenters uh, for their efforts to um, disseminate their fine work. Uh, I'd like to give special thanks to Jacqueline Delora and Tomo Diaz Perez, who have been um, running our Zoom meetings. Uh, they've done an excellent job and I really appreciate all of the hard work they've put into this. Um, okay, so as far as working with the speakers today, um, here's some ways in which you can interact. Um, you can submit questions uh, anytime during the uh, speaker's talk using the Q&A. If you have a question that um, is similar to another question that's already uh, been put into the Q&A, uh, you may want to upvote that question instead of writing your own question, uh, and we'll do our best to uh, pick the questions that have the most interest. Um, if the speaker does not uh, get to your question, uh, we encourage you to follow up with them by email. And uh, with that, I will um, go ahead and start uh, by introducing our first uh, featured speaker. Um, you're, you're welcome to share your screen at any time, Professor Kamat. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Neha Kamat. Um, she obtained her PhD in bioengineering from the University of Pennsylvania and then was a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard University and Mass General Hospital. She is now an assistant professor in the biomedical engineering department at Northwestern University, where she is a member of the Center for Synthetic Biology and the Chemistry of Life Processes Institute. Um, the, Kamat, the Kamat Lab seeks to reimagine the way we engineer biomaterials for applications in medicine, environmental monitoring, and basic biology by using innovations and techniques in synthetic biology and applying them to biomaterial design. Neha has received several prestigious awards, including a Young Investigator Award from the Air Force Office of Scientific Research and the Rice School of Engineering's Outstanding Young Alum Award. Uh, her talk today is Membranes Matter, Designing Bilayer Membranes to Control Functions of Artificial Cells. So Dr. Kamat, uh, thank you very much for joining us and um, please uh, look forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I have the right screen, right? Yes. Let me know. Okay, uh, so I want to start by thanking uh, Dr. Lopez and the organizing committee for putting together this really wonderful program and assembling this community. Um, and in addition, my group has been really enjoying the uh, SINCEL speaker series that have preceded this. So I think that was a, a nice um, forward to this event. So uh, my lab is located at Northwestern University in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at Northwestern. Um, this is in Evanston, Illinois. And uh, we're an interdisciplinary group of biophysicists, biologists, bioengineers, and chemical engineers. Uh, and we spend a lot of time thinking about cell membranes. So I'm going to tell you two short stories today about how we've been thinking about how to harness membrane physical properties to try to um, enhance and control um, functions of artificial cells. So since I'm, I'm kicking off um, the series today, I thought I would spend um, a moment to talk about artificial cells and the way we see them in our group, which is really as a bridge between some of the capabilities of living whole cells and cell-free systems. And really, I, I think we see artificial cells more as a cell-free system, but one where we've been able to bring in some of the functionality um, that the cell membrane provides in terms of biosensing and containment, um, allowing these cell-free systems to be deployed in new environments. So what we know is that um, cell -free cis, uh, or living cells have been engineered to perform a variety of tasks like biosensing and bioproduction. Um, and we can really um, recreate that by taking the guts of those cells out, which um, come in the form of cell-free extracts. And often we can really even surpass some of the capabilities of living cells just by removing the complexity that comes with the living cell. But there are still limitations with cell-free systems. 
um, they're susceptible to dilution. You know, you can't inject a cell free system into um, a person or into groundwater um, and hope that the activity stays the same. It's susceptible to degradation from um, toxins or proteases that it might find in real world samples. And so, you know, by finding a way to compartmentalize and physically segregate cell free systems, we can try to start capturing advantages of um, whole cells as well as cell free extracts. And so some of the goals that we have with these systems are things like designing better biosensors, um, drug delivery vehicles, and bioreactors. And I'd like to take a moment now and just talk a little bit about how we think about designing the compartment, because there are really a variety of ways to design a compartment for an artificial cell. I think you'll see some in upcoming talks. We can think about making them out of purely protein. Uh, you can think about making it out of colloids, um, maybe even um, sugars, or you can have non-compartments, you can have phase segregated aqueous um, systems as well. But for us, um, a major source of inspiration has been the cellular membrane. So this is a structure that you find in every single living organism and really defines this boundary of, of our smallest unit of life, the cell. And if you were to really um, boil down the structure to its basic components, what you would see is that it consists of a phospholipid bilayer, shown here, and, and membrane proteins. And together, these two components really orchestrate a variety of complex processes, from sensing, um, to transport, to signal transduction, to communication with other cells. Um, another feature of, of these membranes is that they can undergo really dynamic shape changes to fuse um, or divide um, or grow. And so, We've been really inspired by the structure, um, particularly because it's quite easy to assemble membranes. If you take lipids and you toss them into water, they'll spontaneously self-assemble into a bilayer. And so they're a great sort of starting structural scaffold to start building your artificial cell. So there's been um, a growing picture emerging when it comes to cell membranes, and that is that the physical properties of this structure really matter. So we can think of the bilayer um, like a material and with as a material, it has material properties in that it can stretch and it can bend, it has a rigidity, it can have defects that affect its permeability um, and exposure of hydrophobic residues. It can have a fluidity, which refers to this ability of lipids to move laterally um, in a membrane. It can have changes in thickness and, and changes in curvature and there, and there are more, I just listed a few here. And what we have been learning is that all of these physical properties play an important role in cellular function, um, particularly in terms of interactions with membrane proteins. So if you introduce curvature in a membrane, you can recruit certain proteins involved in endocytosis. Um, if you change the fluidity of a membrane, this is an example um, from Itai Bhutan and um, Jay Kiesling, where they changed the fluidity of a mitochondrial membrane and changed the dynamics of um, proteins involved in uh, the electron transport chain. And what we also know is that if you can change the elasticity and rigidity of a membrane, you can change the propensity of membrane proteins to assemble as well as their activity. So um, these physical properties are important for, for protein function and cellular function. And we've been asking ourselves how we might be able to harness some of these physical properties to change the overall function of artificial cellular systems as well. So um, when assembling a bilayer membrane and when we want to change the physical properties of it, there are really a wide variety of amplifiers that you might choose to work with. Some are found in natural living cells. They're biologically relevant um, and those are shown up here. Fatty acids and lipids are, are good examples of those, or phospholipids. Um, and then you can have components that assemble into bilayers that are completely uh, not natural. So they might have natural components. They might be made of proteins or peptides or sugars, um, but they're not molecules you would naturally find in living cells. And so um, what, what you see here is often on the, on the bottom side, a way to impart some sort of synthetic control to your membrane. You can engineer durability, um, some sort of chemical responsiveness, uh, new um, physical properties such as hyperthick membranes. And you can mix and match sometimes depending on what kind of um, final property you want your membrane to have. And so in our group, we tend to work with fatty acids, lipids, and then we uh, work with dye block copolymers. 
Today, I'm going to sort of stay in the biologically relevant realm and talk to you mostly about phospholipids. Okay, so um, with these membranes uh, in hand, one of the major goals that we've had in our laboratory is to sort of map out this relationship between composition, biophysical properties of membranes, and ultimately uh, protein dynamics and function. And so that's sort of shown here. Um, can we assemble a membrane that has different biophysical properties? And can we look at how that affects processes like protein folding, uh, protein activity, protein location, and then use that to really engineer new behaviors in artificial cells? So today, um, what I'm going to do is focus on two, uh, two types of membrane properties. Um, that we've specifically tried to harness to drive artificial cell function. And so I'll tell you a short story about membrane domains as well as membrane fluidity. Um, as a brief primer, membrane domains uh, refer to this ability of lipid membranes to phase segregate based on the chemical uh, identity of the lipid. So lipids that are unsaturated, um, tend, we tend to phase segregate with one another relative to lipids that have fully saturated chains and cholesterol tends to be more enriched in these more saturated lipid domains as well. Uh, membrane fluidity refers to this ability of lipids to laterally um, diffuse in a membrane. And there are different ways to modulate this, but I'll talk about one today. Okay, so, and a quick overview, um, what I'll talk about first is a way that we've been trying to design membranes to selectively initiate cell-free reactions. And here, I'll show you how we harness membrane domains to um, improve this process. And then two, um, how we use membrane fluidity to design a system um, for vesicle secretion. Okay, so to begin, um, we were really interested in this idea of trying to control when and where cell-free reactions occur, um, particularly when they're in our compartmentalized vesicle systems. And so you might imagine that um, you, we want to control the initiation of a cell-free reaction in a compartment. Um, and you, if it's, for example, in a bioreactor and you want to reload it with reagents, or if it's in the body and you want to reload it to keep it going, um, or you want to impart some new program to that artificial cell, how can we control where um, a, a cell-free reaction is initiated and when and when it's initiated. And so our approach was to um, use these DNA oligonucleotides to enable targeted vesicle fusion. So this is a, a neat idea that's been around for quite a while, um, starting in probably the early 2000s by the Hook and Boxer groups. Um, these groups use DNA uh, vesicle fusion as, a, as an approach to direct fusion between distinct populations of vesicles. And so what they did was they introduced these um, DNA strands. They can have some sort of hydrophobic molecule like um, cholesterol or a phospholipid. And when you add them to your vesicle, what you can do is direct fusion between distinct populations of vesicles that have complementary DNA on them. And um, what, you, what we thought is if we could um, now add cell-free extract to one vesicle, sort of segregate the components of a cell-free system. And then in another vesicle, put the gene that encodes the protein we want to make. Then when these vesicles come together, we could um, drive uh, protein synthesis. And so these little dyes here indicate another way we can monitor um, this fusion process through FRET dyes that are on our, our lipid surface. Okay, so before I start this, I wanna tell you a little bit about the lipids that we use to design these systems. Um, we work with a mixture, be, um, primarily drawing heavily from previous literature where people have looked at lipids that promote um, fusion without really um, causing nonspecific fusion, which is an also an, an important feature for us. So uh, we work with this um, unsaturated lipid called DOPC. It's not naturally found um, too much, but it has these nice properties of, of being unsaturated. Um, DOPE, which is a phosphatidylethanolamine, um, it helps promote negative curvature, which can, which can help promote fusion. Cholesterol, which also can help promote fusion. And later I'll bring in this ordered phospholipid, DSPC, um, which creates saturated um, domains in our membrane. So the first thing we did was we took our vesicles with these DNA tags 
And we looked to see whether or not we could drive um, fusion to a target vesicle or solution depending on the identity of that target system. And so here what you see is that vesicles that have this oligomer A, um, it does not induce um, lipid mixing, which is our indicator for membrane fusion. Here, when it's mixed with PBS, uh, empty vesicles or vesicles that have non-complementary DNA. But when it's mixed with vesicles that do have this complementary um, DNA to this A strand, we do see lipid, um, significant increases in lipid mixing, indicating fusion. And then we wanted to see, well, can, now can we use the system to actually drive protein expression? And so when we do that, we do in fact see that complementary DNA strands um, enable vesicle fusion between um, vesicles that have these complementary DNA. And it's significantly increased relative to when vesicles are just mixed with PBS or non-complementary DNA, which isn't shown here. But we also encountered a problem. This process is, is sort of not very efficient. We're not making a ton of protein. And we estimate we have really low numbers of vesicles probably actually fusing to drive this process. Um, there also may be issues in terms of encapsulation in, in these systems that also really um, cause this, this efficiency of protein production to suffer. So we thought, what are ways that we could enhance fusion efficiency? And so um, we drew some inspiration from work that's come out of Lucas Tam's group at, at UVA where they've been studying how HIV integrates and fuses with target membranes. And what's, what's quite neat is that HIV virions sense and exploit membrane discontinuities um, to gain entries, entry into cells. And specifically, they enter membranes at these um, interfaces of, of membrane domains. And so what happens here is that when you have unsaturated and saturated lipid domains in a membrane, you create a a line tension because some parts of this um, membrane have hydrophobic components that are exposed to the water. And so that creates a line tension, which creates an energetic cost for fusion or for the system to exist in general. And so fusion, um, what it does is it allows different membranes that have domains to come together, coalesce their domains, and you've uh, reduced the overall energy associated with domains by simply reducing the total number of domains in your system. And so HIV kind of exploits the system. Um, it, it fuses better to two membranes that have domains. And we thought maybe we could use this with our DNA mediated fusion system. And so what we did is um, first just create vesicles. We have this ability to create vesicles with a variety of different um, domains. So you can see that in green here, um, our unsaturated lipids are, are colored in green um, or pseudo, pseudo colored here with a fluorescent dye. Our domains that are saturated can be um, either hyper thin or they can be hyper thick or they can be sort of, sort of hydrophobically matched to the unsaturated domains. So we have a lot of control over the type of domains that we can, that we can create. And so next what we did is we went back to our um, DNA fusion system and we looked at how the presence of these domains impacted lipid mixing. So if we start with a domain that has these hyper thin um, uh, liquid ordered regions, what we find is that um, and in relative to our homogenous systems, which are shown here in a, with a dotted line, we slightly improve um, lipid mixing and DNA mediated fusion. And again, it's specific. So without that, those DNA strands that are complementary to one another, we don't get that same kind of mixing. As we start to increase the length of this saturated domain, we start to see further improvements in DNA specific lipid mixing. And when we make these um, saturated domains hyper thick relative to the unsaturated lipids around them, we get really significant improvements in lipid mixing. And so this was really promising to us that simply by changing the nature of the membrane, we could enhance DNA mediated fusion. So we turned back to our system where we looked at um, protein expression and we wanted to see now does increases in fusion improve the yield of cell-free expression products? And in fact, it does. And we get over sort of a 2.5 fold increase in the actual yield of protein we're making simply by changing the nature of this membrane and improving fusion, all the while still um, maintaining selectivity we're still only getting fusion when we have complementary DNA strains. 
So as a final um, example, what I want to leave you with is we really wanted to see if we could use DNA tethers to selectively control which vesicles were loaded and when, um, which is really a powerful part of using DNA um, relative to, I would say, something like a snare protein where you don't have that kind of specificity where um, you can orthogonally have certain populations of vesicles come together um, while not interacting with others. And so what we did here is we have vesicles with the A and B tethers on them in solution, and we're gonna add them to a variety of vesicles that vary in the identity of the DNA tethers on their surface. And so first what happens if you, if you add vesicles that are completely non-complementary at you know, either at time point zero or time point 10 minutes, you really don't get any lipid mixing indicating no interaction of these vesicles. Um, if you, in contrast, add some vesicles that don't interact with your target population first, but then later do, so the second batch had um, DNA strands that were complementary to the B strand, all of a sudden we do see um, lipid mixing. Similarly, we can get fusion up front, but then when we add a second strand that's not complementary to the target, we do not um, see fusion. And then we can also load our vesicles twice with um, two sort of fusion events. And so this sort of illustrates this power to um, load vesicles over multiple times um, and to select populations simply by using DNA tethers. All right, so to, to wrap up this section, what I hope you, I've showed you is that um, the fusion efficiency between different membranes can be tuned by altering hydrophobic thickness in phase segregated domains. And that um, these phase segregated domains are kind of a new handle to control fusion efficiency in general. And that also DNA mediated vesicle fusion allows for the specific delivery of genetic cargo. Um, there is also some really cool work in this area by Kate Adamala's group. Maybe she'll talk about this um, in, in an upcoming talk, but I encourage you to look at that as well. So, okay, so let's switch gears a little bit and talk about um, another um, function of artificial cells, which is secretion. Um, this ability to release a compound of interest in response to a signal. And I'd like to chat with you a little bit about how we use membrane fluidity to control this function. So cells have this, um, you know, drawing inspiration from engineered cells. They have this great capacity to respond to environmental signals. They process that information and then they respond with, with some response that can be altered gene expression to um, changes in protein activity to secretion. And in advances in synthetic biology have really allowed us to tap into um, genetic circuits of cells and to program living cells with instructions. And so we'd like to take that same approach and bring that to the vesicle world and artificial cell world. Um, and so a membrane function that we thought would be really highly useful to execute with a logic gate is membrane permeability. Um, and so I've shown an example here where we have um, in yellow on the, on the right, an artificial cell-like system that we can design to respond to a specific signal. Um, we'd like to release um, a compound in response to maybe control the activity of a target artificial cell or another cell. Um, and we'd like to be able to do that over multiple cycles as well. And so um, our hope here is that by simply controlling when and the extent to which membrane permeability is enhanced, the uptake and secretion of molecules from a vesicle can be gated. And that gating would enable higher control over really complex functions like the release of synthesized or encapsulated molecules, or it could be used to initiate encapsulated reactions upon entry of a reactive substance. Okay. So there are ma two major questions that um, we were really thinking about, um, about controlling when we think about secretion. And specifically, we were thinking, how do we keep our vesicle intact? And how do we improve the specificity of our response? And so there have been plenty of vesicles that have been designed to secrete components. Um, there's a rich world of biomaterials. We call them stimuli, responsive biomaterials that have been around for a couple decades that in response to things like light, pH, enzymes, um, acoustic waves, they respond by degrading, typically falling apart and releasing their components. And so this is a way to get secretion, but it doesn't allow you to continuously act. Um, you also lose all the components that were in here, including you know, cell-free systems that might be in here as well. And so, um, what, we were, what we've been thinking about is sort of expanding this complexity, um, and we're not alone in this, by using membrane proteins, which allow you to not only respond to these stimuli, 
um, but also potentially other types of stimuli, stimuli simultaneously, and um, also simultaneously maintain stability while allowing for release. And so you could imagine that you couple light to maybe the expression of a channel protein, for example, to, um, to get this sort of coupled stimuli release system. If we were to um, provide a logic gate to describe these systems, I would call these systems on the left, yes gates in response to a signal, they, they secrete components. Um, there's not a lot more that you can often do with them. When you start to think about using membrane proteins, we can think about expanding the complexity of these logic gates. Maybe in response to signal one, you make a protein and channel, and then you get your response, for example. So in terms of secretion, um, we thought a promising approach to control permeability in vesicles um, would be to use a poroforming protein. And so here we turn to probably the most favorite poroforming protein of the artificial cell community, which is alpha hemolysin. Um, I've listed two references here as well that I think were pretty seminal um, works that, that use alpha hemolysin in new ways. Um, Vincent Noro started using alpha hemolysin to um, improve the uh, the production of cell-free um, systems or, or and proteins inside vesicles by simply enabling more transport between nutrients um, and waste between vesicles and feed solutions. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about Sharif Mansi's group who started to couple alpha hemolysin to the detection of um, environmental molecules. And so this, this protein, to give you a little bit of background, is a beta sheet um, barrel protein. It's assembled through um, monomers, first binding a membrane and then oligomerizing to form a pore. Seven of them assemble together to form this pore. And what we started thinking about was, could we actually control channel, um, you know, if you had a channel being produced through a cell-free system in your membrane, could we take a step back and say, let's stop that production, that insertion of that protein from going into the membrane and instead control insertion through the addition of an inducer molecule of some kind to really impart another level of control over, over the system. And so when we think about an inducer molecule we wanted to explore, we started thinking about fatty acids. Um, fatty acids not only integrate readily into bilayer membranes, but they're often really interesting biomarkers for disease. So for an example, they're upregulated near atherosclerotic um, plaques. They're also found sort of upregulated near certain cancer cells and tumor cells. And so we thought this is sort of an interesting molecule to work with for a variety of reasons. And so um, our approach was really um, to try to keep alpha hemolysin from assembling in vesicles when we don't want it to, but then to assemble in response to our inducer molecule. And so that's what I have sort of um, illustrated up here, that we wanted to create an AND gate where um, alpha hemolysin alone does not induce um, secretion from a vesicle, but alpha hemolysin plus our inducer molecule, in this case, we're gonna work with oleic acid, to, um, is together needed to, form, to have assembly of the channel and subsequent release. And so that's sort of what's illustrated here. We have an inactive membrane typically, even in the presence of alpha hemolysin, or in the presence of oleic acid alone, but together the two sort of assemble um, functional pores. So we used, to, to do this, we really drew on an interesting property of alpha hemolysin, which is that its functional assembly depends on membrane composition. And really we think it's, it's dependent on the physical properties of the membrane. And so what we reasoned is that we could assemble a membrane that was really not optimal for alpha hemolysin integration, but that could be altered with a membrane fluidizing molecule to enable AHL integration. And so we first looked at whether we could tune alpha hemolysin induced release of an encapsulated dicalcine by simply altering membrane composition. What we did is um, alpha hemolysin is a cholesterol dependent protein. So we first started just reducing the amount of cholesterol in our system. And what we find is that um, at 20% or lower of uh, cholesterol content, we stop getting alpha hemolysin induced um, release from our system. So that was a good starting point. What we did next was we um, started to see whether we could reassemble alpha hemolysin with this low cholesterol content by simply adding our fatty acid molecule. And so that's what, so what you see in blue is um, the fact that alpha hemolysin over this specific concentration range is not inducing calcium release. As we start to um, incorporate fatty acids into this membrane, 
um, and reduce the DOPC lipid, we start to see a response to alpha hemolysin that is um, improved dramatically at this 50, 20, 30 ratio here, shown here. So this shows us that we can replace the role of cholesterol with this fatty acid. Um, we next set out to see, can we detect exogenous fatty acids in our system? Um, and so the idea here is instead of pre-incorporating fatty acids, can we flow our vesicles into a system that have oleic acid around an induced release? Um, oleic acid has this uh, really lovely property in that it can spontaneously incorporate into membranes, which is quite nice. And so what's shown here on the right is um, really a demonstration of our AND gate. Without any alpha hemolysin, oleic acid alone does not induce release, um, but you need both. You need both the AHL and the oleic acid to induce release in our vesicles. You have a couple minutes left. No. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, I'll just wrap up with the final demonstration here where we turn back to this um, I, really inspiring study by Sharif Manzi's group where um, they coupled alpha hemolysin production to a cell-free system. And so what they really showed here was that um, they used a theophylline riboswitch and the detection of theophylline to um, initiate cell-free expression of alpha hemolysin in a vesicle. And um, what they did was um, demonstrate that you could design vesicles that are responsive to signals that cells normally aren't. In this case, theophylline is not something that E. coli respond to, but theophylline induced the release of alpha hemo of, of IPTG upon the assembly of these pores, leading to the induction of GFP expression in these E. coli cells. So it's a neat demonstration of how we can start to think about um, vesicles as an intermediary messenger between signal cells that cells cannot see, um, and but signals that vesicles are designed to see. And so we thought, can we expand the control of this system further? Um, can we take, for example, the sulfur expression of alpha hemolysin, but now introduce a membrane gate where it's not the alpha hemolysin alone that's required to um, induce secretion, but also um, some component of the membrane needs to be changed as well. And so you can see here that you can really start to increase the complexity of your, of your logic gates by making the membrane an element in them. And so this is our setup. Um, we self-free expressed um, an alpha hemolysin protein in the presence of our inactive vesicles. And what we hoped is that this wouldn't really lead to significant release, but that when we add oleic acid, we could then rapidly um, initiate release in these vesicles. And so that's what um, we're showing here. So if you look at the bottom curves, uh, we have this blue curve, which is alpha hemolysin expression in the presence of our inactive vesicles. Um, and, and so we, you don't see very much um, release of calcium. In contrast, when you express alpha hemolysin in the presence of our you know, ideal composition vesicles for alpha hemolysin, you start to see release um, that correlates with the time frame over which alpha hemolysin is produced. So it's being produced slowly and it's, as it's being produced, it's rapidly integrating and um, releasing calcium. In our inactive vesicles, we can stave that off. And then when we add a lake acid, we get this bump um, up to around the levels we see with our active membrane. So this sort of demonstrates that um, by working with, with membrane composition, we can start to temporally control when proteins are integrated into our vesicles and have better control over our vesicle systems in general. Um, so, so just to start wrapping up here, we have um, shown you a demonstration of how lipid membranes can be designed to incorporate functional pores in response to changes in membrane composition. And in conjunction with cell-free systems, we think that um, vesicles can be designed to both synthesize and secrete encapsulated molecules with um, further temporal control. Okay, so what I've shown you today are kind of two examples of how we can harness membrane biophysical properties to enable new artificial cell function. Um, membrane domains allowed us to take membrane fusion and control protein synthesis. Better membrane fluidity um, provided a handle to control protein integration, ultimately controlling protein release. Um, we do a lot of work in our lab as well, looking at the effects of membrane elasticity on membrane protein folding and how that um, ultimately controls protein synthesis and activity. And um, what I'd like to end by saying is that artificial cells are not only a really wonderful platform um, to use biological parts to engineer new tools and behaviors, but they're a terrific model system to learn why bi um, more about biology 
and why cells change their composition. Um, and so we think by uncovering this relationship between composition, physical properties, and vesicle function, we can really understand also more about how cells um, and why cells change their composition in response to specific um, events and stimuli. So with that, I'll, I'll end and thank um, my really terrific group um, and team of, of researchers that we work with. Um, and I'll give a shout out to Justin Peruzzi who led the work with the DNA mediated membrane fusion um, and Claire Hilberger, um, who was an undergrad at the time and is now a grad student at Berkeley, who led the work with the oleic acid induced um, secretion. And with that, I will take questions. Thank you very much for a very nice talk, Dr. Kamat. Um, I really like the way that you justify each step of your work um, in the context of previous enabling research. I think that uh, brings a um, brings a very logical um, uh, way of, th of thinking about how to move forward in this field. Um, I, I, I like the, the, the two stories that you told and I'm wondering about your vision for uh, coupling these two new capabilities um, for protein expression upon gene, uh, upon a fusion and, and secretion. Uh, do, do you plan to uh, couple those going forward? Yeah, that, that's an interesting um, question. I think that we could we could definitely certainly do that. You could introduce an alpha hemolysin plasmid into um, a target vesicle to induce release. Um, I, I we haven't really thought about it too much, but I think yeah, there's layers to start, you know, kind of combining together here. I think when it comes to secretion, it would be great to start thinking about ways to have selective secretion. Um, this is a problem I hope as a community we can start to work on as well, where we um, we don't, you know, alpha hemolysin is, is lovely, but it's a huge pore. And so are there ways to control the secretion of specific either packets of things inside our, our vesicles or specific molecules as well? Well, there, there's, uh, of course, a whole family now of engineered hemolysins, right? The yeah. principle you could bring to bear. Um, we have a, a question from Jefferson Smith. Um, he said, thank you for the great talk. Were there any specific rules you considered when designing the DNA snares, uh, length, uh, GC content, sequence, et cetera? Right, oh, that's a great question. So we, um, in this case, drew pretty heavily from um, a great body of literature in this in this space. And so um, there's, there's a couple groups that have been, um, the, the hook group is, is one who's come up with some um, really nice um, DNA systems that are orthogonal to one another and that also seem to promote fusion. And, and they've done a lot of work looking at design rules. Um, you know, you, your, your DNA strands, um, need, it, it's helpful if they're a certain length to, to promote affinity, a certain, also a certain length and distance away from your membrane as well. Um, but not too far. So, so we, we drew from that and we started working with those sequences to, to begin with. Great, thank you. I uh, have another question from Tom Robinson. He asked, does the enhancement of lipid mixing with domains also enhance content mixing? Yes, so we did some, um, that's right. So what we were looking at with our lipid mixing was really, um, you know, you could get these pre uh, hemi fused states that are not necessarily fusion and um, uh, and and there's not necessarily content mixing. So we had done some content mixing studies with calcine to look at content mixing, but ultimately those gene expression studies we showed um, at the end are content mixing assays. So the gene and the cell free expression systems really need to interact with one another in order to make that protein. So our output um, in those studies was a content mixing assay. Okay, um, um, one final uh, question just popped up um, from an anonymous attendee. Uh, thank you for a wonderful talk. Prior to adding oleic acid, would you say that alpha hemolysin remains as monomers in the solution or if it binds to the membrane as non-pore forming monomers or oligomers? Yeah, good question. Uh, we, we were trying to figure out um, what could be really happening here. So. There's, I, what, what we know about beta, share, beta barrel um, oligomers is that they tend to kind of adhere and assemble on the, uh, in vesicles, um, at least 
surface adhered at the very least, and then they oligomerize inside the membrane. And so I would presume that they were, in, you know, interacting with the membrane to some degree. Um, we think what the oleic acid is doing is either changing the distribution of cholesterol, um, or it could be um, changing the fluidity in a way that allows these oligomers to come together. Um, there's, you know, a third possibility that it's changing the local curvature to help. So, you know, I said fluidity, but there's a few things that could really be happening here. Um, and uh, my guess is to answer your question that the monomers are, are interacting with the membrane, but are just not assembling. Thank you very much. Uh, mm -hmm. With that, we will close this talk. And uh, Dr. Kamat, um, I think you can be assured that uh, around the world, people are applauding your wonderful talk. Thank you, that was very nice. Thank you so much. Uh, our next talk uh, is, um, will be by Jacqueline DeLora. Uh, Dr. DeLora is a postdoctoral research at the Max Planck Institute for Medical Research. Uh, Jacqueline obtained her PhD at the University of New Mexico and has also been an invaluable member of our SINCEL organizing committee and uh, a lot of the, of the content that you are seeing, uh, she helped provide. She'll be talking about engineering droplet-based programmable stem cell niches. Jacqueline? Thank you for the kind introduction, Gabrielle. Um, I'm very happy to be contributing a talk today. So thank you for the invitation. Um, and we'll go ahead and just jump right in. So in the past 20 years or so, uh, many investigations have characterized the role that mechanics play in stem cell differentiation with um, foundational studies in, especially in two dimensional cell culture showing that substrate stiffness induces cell fate programs such as in skin, muscle, brain, and even in bone tissue formation. And now if we fast forward to the last couple of years and the rising popularity of three dimensional cell culture approaches, it is now also obvious that timing of key biological events is instrumental for the formation of these higher ordered structures, such as organoids. Um, organoids are miniaturized versions of um, vital organs that are grown in vitro from stem cells. And as you can see with this illustrated protocol here, there are many complex and time dependent steps that influence the formation of different types of organoids. In this case, it's an example of a lung organoid. Um, and what's, what's important to know here is that there's a really distinct interplay between not only spatially defined mechanisms such as the stiffness of the environment, but also the timing that these types of interactions occur within. Um, so the goal of my project then is to develop a unifying in vitro model system that will enable us to mimic the stem cell niche while implementing control over space and timing of these key biological processes to standardize the um, organoid formation. And why this is important is that there are a few technological challenges in organoid formation that deal with two primary um, parameters, that being complexity and standardization. So we take our stem cells from sources, three-dimensional sources, we transfer them into two-dimensional culture environments. They go through many different uncontrolled stresses before they're actually able to form their three-dimensional structures. And in this transition from the two-dimensional to the three-dimensional world, there's also a lack of standardization because many different types of laboratories are focusing on many different types of organoid formation schemes. And so the, comp the protocols themselves are complex. They use very complex timing and media induction and substrates, usually glass, that are just not reca recapitulating the actual environment. Um, so in my PhD work at the University of New Mexico, I focused on building standardized three-dimensional droplet templated um, cell culture platforms. And I just like to point your attention to those um, quickly as these could definitely um, form, the for form the standardized method for creating a synthetic niche. So in the first implementation, I used oil-free acoustic acoustic droplet microfluidics in order to encapsulate cells in droplet microenvironments. And the advantage here is that instead of using 
oil and water systems, we're now using a fully aqueous two-phase separation chemistry, um, which is now a highly biocompatible um, system. And further, if you are looking at increasing the throughput, um, we developed a high throughput centrifugal droplet generating device that uses readily available materials in any um, standard lab, and you can uh, encapsulate cells in very homogeneously distributed droplet populations. So these could be a basis for templating the formation of synthetic stem cell niches. But for today, what I want to focus on is actually zooming into the cell adhesion mediated interactions that actually impact the formation of organoids. And this really starts in, in the stem cell niche as organoids, as I said before, um, are formed from stem cells. So in the early days of um, embryogenesis or tissue formation, the interactions between cells in the niche are really dependent on cell-to-cell -cell e cadherin types of interactions that maintain the stemness of the cells and self renewal. And then over time, and with different types of mechanical cues and the deposition of native extracellular matrix, um, these cells start to transition from a largely cadherin mediated um, regulation into more cell to extracellular matrix interactions, and these can lead to then different cell fate programs. And so what's important to take away here is, is this question, how does mechanics and timing translate into organoid formation? And um, for me, um, now launching into the synthetic cell community, I think it's very important to start to consider hybrid approaches where we're taking synthetic cells and we're interfacing them with natural cells and we're using concepts from bottom-up synthetic biology to really pinpoint the types of interactions that we want to gain a fundamental understanding over. And so, for example, in this first, um, in this first iteration, you can see that the synthetic cell is coupled to the natural cell or stem cell in this case through cadherin interactions. Um, the stem cell could be excuse me, the stem cell could be a range of different types of formations, which I'll go over in the next slide. And it's also important to think about the actual mechanical modulation that is underlying these cadherin uh, junctions. And then furthermore, uh, a lot of work has already been done in tissue engineering with respect to cell and extracellular matrix interactions. But it's also worth mentioning that controlled coupling of the cell to the ECM is by native integrins from the stem cell side in my, in my design. And that things like matrix, matrix stiffness, ligand spacing, and density should be controlled in these in vitro cell cultures. And we're gonna do that using light or optogenetics tools. And when we take these uh, types of interactions, either discreetly or in combination, then we can start to think about controlled differentiation programs where these stem cells will over um, different types of mechanical cues in time form phenotypes that we perhaps expect or also emergent phenotypes that we didn't necessarily expect. Um, and in this, I would like to say that potentially these hybrid systems could even exceed the functionality of organoids as we know them today. So um, in my experimental design, my, my synthetic cell is actually formed using a ferrofluid in order to make this synthetic cell magnetic. And in this case, um, we take this magnetic um, core of this of the synthetic cell, and we decorate the interface. Um, this is an oil droplet in water using a different concoction of lipids, cholesterol for functionalization, and then we can functionalize the surface using a his tag e cadherin. Um, that's a recombinant protein. So this is the cell to syn cell interaction and the cell to extracellular matrix interaction. Um, working with Seraphine Wegner's group. We're using um, photo ECM, which consists of a recombinant protein that uses LOVE2, the light oxygen voltage gated protein that is an optogenetic switch where in the dark conditions, this J alpha helix is folded. It's hiding an RGD ligand. And whenever you expose these proteins to blue light, they um, undergo a conformational switch and the RGD is then available for the native integrins on the stem cells to adhere. 
Um, I'm not going to focus too much on the photo ECM. I'm going to focus mostly on some of our preliminary work that we've been able to put together using the magnetic stem cells. Um, so although our goal is definitely to move into three-dimensional cell culture, it's worth it to start in two and 2.5 dimensional cell cultures to really gain an understanding of how the stem cells are interacting with the natural cells. So the way that we're doing this is by patterning surfaces with a mean functionalized chemistry um, using laser lithography and also coding with our photo ECM molecules eventually so that we get a nice sort of networked hybridization approach to our two-dimensional cell culture. From there, we will seed our um, stem cells. We'll allow these native and synthetic e cadherin interactions to evolve. Um, at this stage, the integrins are probably not interacting with the surface because as you can see here, the photo ECM is, is, in, is in its closed conformation in the dark. And then eventually over time and different types of modulation using either magnetic um, deformation of the droplets in order to probe the interaction um, with the e cadherin or by illuminating the surface of our two dimensional cell culture, we can now start to control the and actually measure, for example, the force between the e cadherin interactions and maybe um, also how the adhering of the integrins to the surface um, changes things like actin cytoskeleton organization. So where, we're our, where we are so far is really focusing on the generation and the biofunctionalization of these magnetic droplets or these magnetic synthetic cells. And we're doing this using a glass capillary microfluidics device um, that I actually developed um, when I was still at the University of New Mexico. So we have this um, nice capillary mounting block that allows us to create a core shell annular fluid flow. And this entire block um, where you have the ferrofluid coming through the center and our oil plus, or excuse me, our water plus surfactants and different types of biomolecules in the sheath. Um, this entire thing sits within a piezoelectric transducer and it allows us to create these oil droplets in the air. Um, we have to use um, a sort of unusual nozzle geometry because of the surface tension characteristics of the ferrofluid. Um, and so it's an extruded nozzle with a 20 micron diameter um, orifice and it's nested within a 300 micron diameter orifice. We use different um, combinations of flow rates and a 25 kilohertz modulation frequency in order to produce droplets that you see here. They're actually produced in the air and then we collect them in, in a water bath. And there's a very delicate balance between the stabilization of these droplets and their ability to be functionalized. And so we've gone through many different iterations of trying to figure this out using a lot of different types of surfactants. But so far, as you can see here in this first um, microscopy image, we're able to functionalize the surface of the droplets using a cholesterol peg fitzy molecule where the cholesterol just absorbs the hydrophobic interface. And we're also able to further um, attach our recombinant e cadherin that's his tagged onto the surface of the droplet and take it all the way through a, a secondary antibody staining in order to image it. Um, so now when we put these droplets into uh, cell culture, some interesting things happen. So in this uh, first time-lapse image, you're seeing the droplets cultured with C2, C12 um, cells and they're bare. They don't have any e cadherin on the surface. And you can watch uh, the droplet or the magnetic stem cell, which is in black, sort of um, being kicked around by the cells, but not really integrated into the culture. Whereas in the second microscopy image where we do have e cadherin on the surface of the magnetic stem cell, not only are the cells starting to push the magnetic stem cell around, but they're actually taking it into their colony as they're proliferating and sort of integrating it in, into their um, culture environment. Um, and then when we do our endpoint assay on um, this culture, we stain for e cadherin, the nucleus, and also um, keratin is just already being expressed by these cells. And you can see that the magnetic stem cells actually sit down and the nucleus form these sort of kidney bean structures around the magnetic stem cell, which is interesting. It suggests that potentially we could start to look at some subcellular um, force manipulations. Um, and then finally, 
what we'd really like to do is, and so in these previous videos, you see the magnetic stem cells being kicked around, but we really need these to be stable in culture, immobilized on the surface so that we can actually manipulate and deform the stem cell in order to uh, take some force measurements uh, for the ECAD here. And, and so um, what we've been able to do so far, as you see here, is attach the droplets to the surface of a pattern glass substrate. And you can see that up into the Z direction, we have some that are floating, but really they, they are attached down to the surface. Um, so with this, I will leave you with the outlook for my project, and that is really to create organoid cultures that we can have control over from the from the stem cell origination um, using things like magnets and lights and different types of physical forces. Um, okay, so with that, I would like to make some acknowledgments. Um, I moved to Germany from Albuquerque, New Mexico, for my postdoc position. Um, right as the pandemic was really starting to take shape. And I have to just say that I'm very extremely grateful for joining the group that I did and for um, just how, how amazing everybody has been to make me feel comfortable here in Germany. Um, so especially for the support and mentoring of Professor Schwatz, um, the supervision and collaboration from Dr. Platzman. Um, I have to point out my co-author, Siddharth Pashapur, who has made all of these results um, possible and just a great positive contribution to the work, as well as to my other colleagues just for their amazing support. Um, Seraphine Wegner from Uni Munster for um, helping me with the photo ECM, which I'm really excited uh, to move forward with that as well. And then finally, I would just like to mention that I am an early career editor for Molecular Biology of the Cell, where we are curating preprints and bioarchive, and um, I'm serving as sort of a liaison for the synthetic cell community um, as, as we start to interface natural cells with synthetic cells. So if you have a preprint that you're interested in sharing with the molecular biology community, um, please feel free to reach out to me and, and share it. I'd be happy to pass it on. Um, so with that, I'm happy to take any questions and thank you. Great, thank you very much, uh, Jacqueline, for a very nice talk. Uh, very interesting to see uh, where you're going with this work. Um, if there are questions for Dr. Delora, please submit them on the Q&A. Uh, I guess uh, my question is uh, about um, um, the optimal size for your ferrofluid uh, synthetic cells uh, with regards to your end goal of imparting um, um, strain or, and stress uh, onto the culture. Um, have you considered really what, what size of uh, magnetic uh, particles would, would be optimum? Yes, this is definitely something that we've had quite a few discussions over. And I think it really depends on what you're trying to modulate. So I think in the ideal situation, having a cell size magnetic synthetic cell um, would be ideal, but perhaps you want to impart a stronger force or something like this. And the formulation of the ferrofluid droplet is pretty manipulable. And so you could definitely start to tune some of these types of parameters. Um, but with the droplet generating instrumentation that we've built here in Stuttgart, it's, it's possible to control the size of the droplets from about 10 microns in diameter all the way up to hundreds. So, so has a have, nice range. You have a good dynamic range for that. Yeah. Um, you know, it's quite interesting that the, the nuclei um, seem to be deforming and that's certainly going to have uh, an impact I think on the cell behavior and so it'll be interesting to see where that goes. Definitely it's something we're very interested in looking into. So. Any other questions for Dr. Delora? Okay, Jacqueline, well, um, thank you very much uh, for a very nice talk. Uh, we are pretty much on time. And so I think we will move on now. Uh, Dr. Gottfried, if you would go ahead and start sharing your slides. Uh, our next talk is from Kirsten Gottfried. Um, she obtained her PhD in physics and was a Gates Cambridge fellow as well as a Winton fellow 
in the Cavendish Laboratory at the University of Cambridge. Um, Kristen was then a Marie Sklodowska Curie postdoctoral fellow at the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems in Stuttgart, Germany. And now since uh, 2019, she has been an independent Max Planck Research Group leader in biophysical engineering at the Max Planck Institute for Medical Research, where she is exploring de novo approaches to create synthetic cells from the bottom up. In particular, her work focuses on DNA na nanotechnology as a tool to arrange components inside synthetic cells in space and time, or to construct functional units from scratch. She is also a member of the Excellence Cluster 3D Matter Made to Order. So uh, her talk today is um, a shortcut towards synthetic cell division. Welcome, Kirsten, and uh, thank you very much for uh, presenting this talk. Yeah, good morning or good evening, everyone, depending on where you are. It's really great to come together with uh, so many like-minded like -minded synthetic biologists, at least uh, virtually. So the title of this conference is uh, Engineering uh, Synthetic Cells and Organelles. And we often do this actually by isolating biomolecules from cells like proteins, for instance, and then recombining them with the common vision to really create a synthetic cell from scratch. And now, as we all know, this is, this is super hard. And um, now I may ask if this could be because we are actually approaching the problem as scientists. Now, what if we actually were to take the word engineering a bit more serious and actually engineer cells like they have never been? So really take synthetic building blocks, program their assembly to make synthetic cells with new ways of information storage and replication, cells which may look a bit different from life as we know it, but have the same basic functionality. Now, because if you think about it, recombining the pieces of the puzzle can actually be very hard. Whereas actually, if you're open to use new tools and new materials, there might actually be a more straightforward solution. And now, um, of course, there are many tools and many materials that one could use. Um, in this talk, I would like to show you two, namely DNA nanotechnology and microfluidics that uh, we found very useful in, in our work, but of course, I think the most important message is that I'm sure there are others and it's, it's really great to be constantly scanning the horizon for new tools uh, to make synthetic cells. Um, so I will present these two tools and then also uh, two functions that we have implemented recently. So let's start. Microfluidics has actually developed lots of on-chip on functions which we can directly take and repurpose for the uh, purpose of building a synthetic cell. And in particular, useful is this one, the droplet formation module, where we can simply make cell-sized compartments in very, very high throughput. And now you may argue that these cell-sized droplets may be cell-sized, but they are not really cell-like because they are water and oil emulsions. And ultimately, ideally, we'd like to have a water and water system where you could, for instance, also reconstitute membrane proteins um, as better mimics of synthetic cells. And for this reason, we actually developed a technique to transform microfluidic unilar melalipid vesicles simply by encapsulating the content that we want to have inside the synthetic cell, as well as the lipids inside these microfluidic droplets. And then under the right conditions, we can actually obtain fusion of the lipids at the compartment periphery, so that we are basically creating a supported lipid bilayer in 3D. And we can then release this as a giant unilamella vesicle um, by breaking up the emulsion. Um, so now one can do this with microfluidics, but uh, the nice thing is that it's actually also quite easy to do uh, with, a, with what we call a shaking approach. So simply in a, in a quite quick one epi um, procedure without special equipment. Um, and this is, uh, this is why um, I made the protocol for this procedure available in this, uh, in this publication to really, to really pass it on uh, to the synthetic biology community. I hope this may be a useful um, technique for some of you, and this is actually why I wanted to share it um, as, a, as a technique to make giant unilamella vesicles without the need for microfluidics is a, a, a useful tool. 
um, and related technologies to first of all make the compartments, but ultimately we also need to fill the compartments. And here DNA nanotechnology comes into play. So first of all, what is DNA nanotechnology? Well, DNA nanotechnology is about repurposing DNA as a construction material, um, simply based on the complementary base pairing of DNA. So this is not about genetics, it's purely about art. Use DNA to build complex shapes, but um, actually even a quite simple DNA linker can already be very useful because you can exploit the programmability of the DNA and the um, available toolbox for the chemical functionalization. So I just wanted to show you in this case, for instance, we uh, we tagged the DNA we tagged the DNA strand with a cholesterol moiety so that it would self-assemble at the compartment periphery and thereby provide an attachment handle for a complementary piece of DNA, which can, for instance, be functionalized with actin. And like this, you can imagine we cannot just uh, use it as a linker for actin, but for many, many other components. Um, in this case, we did use it for actin. So here we have an uh, actin fibers inside the uh, actin filaments inside the compartment, uh, together with uh, motor proteins in the form of myosin coated beads. Now, if you add ATP, you can actually get the symmetry breaking contraction of these compartments, uh, of these of these uh, filaments inside the compartment. So now, of course, you may say, okay, of course, but the, all the dynamics are still carried out by proteins in this system, right? The DNA linkers are just passive. So now, can we actually make dynamic DNA linkers um, and make the dynamics, put the dynamics in the DNA system itself? Well, um, yes, we can, and I would like to take one minute to, uh, to tell you a cautionary tale about uh, building dynamic DNA nanostructures. So once we started to work on this, we actually wanted to make a pH switch where we could trigger the attachment of a complementary piece of DNA uh, to the compartment periphery with pH. And you can see this here, where we are using a triplex DNA motif, which opens up and attaches to the compartment periphery at elevated pH. And now when we did this, um, we played around with the fluorophores a little bit because as you know, we're like typically in DNA nanotechnology, we just pick the fluorophore that matches our setup requirement and so on. And we were puzzled by the fact that we saw completely different behavior in fact. So you see here that for instance, at the intermediate pH, just by changing the fluorophore, nothing else. The DNA sequence is, is staying the same, just the fluorophore on this strand and on this strand is changing. And we com can completely change or even inhibit the dynamic switching. And um, we studied this in detail actually, and we found with experiments and MD simulations that actually what's happening here is that uh, fluorophores, especially side dyes, are stabilizing the bound as well as the unbound stain, thereby effectively increasing the energy barrier for dynamic uh, switching, which means that uh, the choice of DNA, uh, the choice of fluorophore can completely alter or inhibit the, DNA, uh, the dynamics of DNA nanostructures if you want to put it negatively. If you have knowledge about this effect, however, you can also harness it and actually use the fluorophores to tune the energy. Um, fortunately, we've lost uh, Dr. Gopric's feed. Um, Jacqueline, can you send her a note? Yes, definitely. We were having connection issues here in Germany. Um, we had unstable connection here for a couple of minutes already. So hopefully she can reconnect. I urge our attendees to please bear with us while we try to sort this out. Hopefully we can get Kirsten back on here to finish her, uh, her very nice story. It was just getting interesting.
can I ask Jacqueline a question in the meantime? Sure. Jacqueline, did, did your structure, did your um, magnetic nanoparticles have a lipid bilayer on them? Um, it's not a bilayer, it's probably a monolayer. Oh, okay. Um, but yes, we do use lipids. Okay, but it somehow enabled the, the e cadherin. So, yeah, so we use um, a lipid that has NTA nickel already conjugated onto it, and then our histag e cadherin can attach directly to that. Okay, thank you. It looks like Kirsten is back, so. <laughs> Hi, Kirsten. <laughs> thank you very much for, uh, for taking over. And I should say uh, thanks to, to my group who just came in <laughs> to, to let me know that I would have continued, you know. <laughs> Oh, no. um, I didn't even realize I popped out. Um, so I think you were, uh, when, when, you, when you popped out, uh, I think you were talking about the um, Psi-3 art artifact that you discovered. Yes. So, um, so now I should be ready to share again. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, wait. Okay. So, yes, now I should be back at the right place, huh? Yes. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, so uh, the last thing I wanted to say about this is that um, I would uh, like to point you towards this data to read more about this effect and also towards Kevin's talk um, on, on um, using this effect actually to, to trigger the attachment of an exoskeleton, which is still online uh, in the speaker series. Um, I would like to move on actually to a DNA-based uh, cytoskeleton, which we developed very recently, and the functions that we implemented with it. So first of all, um, I should say that, uh, first of all, we have to actually design the architecture of uh, such DNA-based filaments before we can actually implement a function. And I should say that we did this uh, in collaboration with Laura Naliu and Peng Sei Plan at the University of, of Stuttgart. So here you can see actually, um, if we want to make a DNA-based cytoskeleton, a linear duplex is no longer enough. So actually here we have DNA tiles, which are made of five DNA strands. Each of them can cross over from one duplex to the other uh, to form this single tile. And these single tiles can then polymerize via sticky ends into, uh, into multiple tiles and ultimately these hollow tubes that are composed of eight uh, DNA duplexes. And now if we assemble them, we can look at them in the confocal microscope in bulk, first of all, and then also encapsulate them inside microfluidic droplets. And here you see uh, our synthetic version of a, of a cytoskeleton inside microfluidic droplets. Now, inspired by acting filaments, which obviously assemble based on, uh, based on ATP, up on ATP addition, um, we also wanted to have a more biological trigger to assemble our DNA-based filaments so we actually functionalize them with a split aptamer, which in the presence of ATP um, hybridizes um, and, and uh, basically forms filaments only in the presence of ATP. You can see here, if you add ATP, then these filaments begin to polymerize similar to, um, the, to their natural uh, counterpart. Um, we can, of course, quantify this uh, assembly process. And to quantify the degree of polymerization, since we cannot measure it directly in 3D confinement, we took the porosity phi as a proxy um, and we measured, we tracked the porosity over time. And you can see here in yellow for the assembly of the DNA filaments, how it increases over the course of about 40 minutes and uh, similar time scales can be seen for the um, polymerization of an actin cytoskeleton inside these uh, droplets. So DNA filaments can be polymerized with natural triggers, but since we're using DNA, we can also go beyond the functionality of nature and actually, uh, for instance, realize uh, assembly as well as disassembly based on strand displacement reactions. So here we have tiny overhangs, so-called toe holes, where we can attach a DNA strand which has a higher affinity, which then leads to disassembly of the filaments and we can then add a so-called, what we call an anti-invader strand, which is again displacing the filament, which leads to disassembly and is then leading to filament reassembly. So we can really have a reversible system, uh, not just with DNA strands, also with uh, aptamer target interactions where we can actually polymerize these DNA filaments also in the presence of, of uh, proteins and, and ATP. 
in this case, in a reversible manner. But now I, I promise the function, and if we, we have already realized assembly, but of course, if we, if we see these nice new movies of the motors that walk on the NA filaments, this is really where we take our inspiration from how vesicles could be transported along such a filament. Now, um, how can we implement such a seemingly complex function in a DNA-based system? And now I should really try and explain this properly. So um, first of all, we start with our DNA-based filaments, which we now actually functionalize with uh, black DNA overhangs and a complementary red strand, which is actually half DNA and half RNA. So the DNA part is here hybridizing to the black strand, and uh, then we have a single-stranded RNA overhang, which can hybridize to uh, this gray DNA strand, which we attach to a gold nanoparticle. The gold nanoparticle was supposed to be our first cargo that mimics the, the cargo in a, in a natural cell. Um, so yeah, and then we add to the system, we add RNase H, and now RNase H is Cleaving DNA RNA is cleaving the RNA in DNA RNA hybrids, which means that it's kind of destroying the track uh, where the gold nanoparticle has already been. It's releasing the RNA, and this means we have kind of a burn bridge mechanism where uh, the gold nanoparticle can roll along this track, but it can only go to the direction where it has not yet been. So this should give us a strategy to get really unidirectional rolling motion of the gold nanoparticle along this filament um, by the activity of the RNAs H. Now, how can we track this? Um, well, we, we did a trick. We actually uh, functionalized this uh, DNA-RNA hybrid strand with a biotin stripped evidence, which simply serves us for functionalization. So um, when, once the gold nanoparticle has walked along the filament, actually this, uh, this biotin stripped evidence should be cleaved off which should mean that the filament becomes thinner. And this now we try to observe with uh, TEMP, um, transmission electron microscopy. So what you see here is the DNA filament. The gold nanoparticle is nicely bound to it. And now as the gold nanoparticle is uh, moving along its track, the, uh, the biotin streptavidin gets cleaved, gets removed from the track. And this is why the track is becoming, becoming thinner um, as uh, in the places where the gold nanoparticle has already been. And now if, you, if we were to look a bit later, the gold nanoparticle would probably be here and, and the filament would be thinner here as well. Now, of course, we want to extend this to more biologically relevant cargo, now, namely, um, namely vesicles, and also to track this in 3D. So first of all, we did the same strategy as for the gold nanoparticle with the lipid vesicle in SUV. We attached it to the filaments. Um, here you can see in a TEM image that the filaments seen here in white are actually attached to the, uh, to the DNA filaments. And here also instead inside confinement, you see, the, you see the same thing. We have the DNA filaments and in red, the small SUVs attached to them. Now, how can we track the movement that's actually happening in 3D? Again, we did a trick. Um, we attached a fluorophore to the DNA RNA hybrid, which should get cleaved off as the, um, uh, as the SUV is rolling along the track. And this is indeed what we observe. So as you can see here, the filaments are kind of disappearing. The porosity is decreasing over time. Um, and actually, um, this is not because the filaments disassemble. This is simply because the fluorophores are being cleaved off because we know this because we can actually release the filaments from the droplets in the end and we can look at them and we can see that they are perfectly intact. That it's just the fluorophores that have been chopped off by this rolling motion of the, um, of the SUV or by the activity of the RNAs H rather. Now we can quantify this. We can do, we of course have to do control experiments. For instance, in the absence of RNAs H, we don't see the decrease in fluorescence. Um, we don't see the decrease in fluorescence if the, uh, the uh, SUVs are not bound to the particles, but we do see it actually in a concentration dependent manner when uh, the RNAs H is there and the system is complete. Um, we can also use these, uh, these tracks to actually have an order of magnitude estimate for the transport velocity and we get about 100 nanometer per, per minute, um, which is quite comparable 
to uh, similar similar systems which have been realized in bulk where actually uh, particles were moved along a, a, a carpet uh, of DNA in bulk so not on a filament not in confinement but still we get to say uh, but still um, these reports uh, from the group of Kalisalaita, for instance, got, got similar orders of magnitude uh, of the motion. So now um, coming to uh, division um, as, as a second function that I wanted to show you today. So um, obviously um, we would love to actually uh, obtain division in the presence of our DNA-based cytoskeletons or maybe even mediated by, by DNA-based cytoskeletons because obviously in a natural cell, the cytos uh, this would be one of the functions that a cytoskeleton should fulfill. Um, unfortunately, we are not yet there. And actually one should also, uh, should also realize that the reconstitution of natural proteins into, uh, into vesicles has also not led to complete division of lipid vesicles. So actually, I think we do need a shortcut, a creative shortcut to actually obtain synthetic cell division in a more simple way. So we actually were asking, can we divide synthetic cells relying on simple physical principles? And now this is actually the first thing uh, we came up with um, to, divide, to divide compartments inside microfluidic chips. But of course, this is uh, not very autonomous. So ultimately, we'd like to have an autonomous division mechanism for lipid vesicles or synthetic cells. And here we really went back to the drawing board and thought, okay, what, what ingredients does division actually need? Well, first of all, if you have a spherical object, you somehow need to define the plane of division, right? You need to tell the vesicle where to divide. Secondly, if you, if you have division, uh, two small compartments have a larger surface compared to their volume, compared to the, to the initial mother compartment, the initial compartment. Um, so we have an increase in surface to volume ratio, basically. So first of all, how can we define the plane of division? We re realize this is actually already out there uh, simply by using phase separation. A lipids phase separate into a liquid ordered and a liquid disordered phase if we choose the right lipid mixture. And an increase in surface to volume ratio can be achieved by osmosis. So basically, since the lipid membrane is permeable to water, if we evaporate water in the background and increase the salt concentration thereby, we get water efflux through the, through the GOV membrane. And this is actually, uh, if we assume that there is a line tension at the domain boundary, uh, the domain interface should kind of shrink and minimize so that ultimately this should lead to the, to the complete division or into two uh, daughter vesicles if the line tension is large enough. So actually, we went and tried this. Uh, Yannick made uh, phase-separated lipid vesicles, as you can, uh, can see here in this picture. And then if you expose them to an osmotic pressure, you can see how, how over the course of the time, they indeed divide into two vesicles. And yes, they are really divided. They are not connected by some lipid tubes or so. They quickly diffuse apart at the end of this um, division process. Now, um, because this is actually a quite simple mechanism, we can actually build a, a theoretical model of this process simply by uh, simply by inputting that the equilibration is shrinking, the, uh, is, uh, that the uh, osmotic pressure is equilibrating, and that their formation is minimizing the contact area between the two phases because of the line tension at the domain boundary. So we simply use the geometry of the system and no fitting parameters for this model but uh, it gives us an output which we can test experimentally. In fact, we have four predictions from the model that we all tested and verified in experiments. Um, first of all, the osmolarity ratio that is required for division is square root of two. The time point of division is independent of the vesicle size. Asymmetric division should happen faster. And finally, any process that is increasing the osmolarity to this ratio of square root of two should lead to division. So now we tested all four of those. I will just show the first and the last one. So osmolarity ratio required for division. So the model tells us that at different osmolarity ratios, we should have defined vesicle shapes as shown here. Um, and division should happen at 1.41 at, at an osmolarity ratio of square root of two. We can now introduce a division parameter, which is basically quantifying the progression of the division by, um, by uh, basically looking at the formation of the constriction here and plot this over the osmolarity ratio. And then we should get this curve. 
And now we can actually prepare buffer solutions of different osmolarities. Um, so here you can see um, that, the, that the vesicles actually take on exactly the shapes that we predicted in the model. Of course, we have to repeat this experiment, repeat it uh, many times, and then we get uh, error bars for these, uh, for, for these data points. And we see that um, the experimental data is actually fitting the, the theoretical prediction quite well. Now we realize what we've actually built is a pretty good osmolarity sensor, sensor which we can use uh, under the microscope um, so this is this is not just um, a cell division mechanism. It's actually also a sensor that we have built. But of course, uh, for us as synthetic biologists, we care about the division first of all. Um, and this is why I would like to come to the to the final prediction, which is any process that induces a change in osmolarity should be suitable to actually trigger division. Now. Um, we, we chose actually to look at a metabolic reaction, namely we fed our synthetic cells with a sugar solution and added the, the enzyme invertase, which is actually breaking up uh, the sugar and making two molecules out of one in each reaction step, meaning that the osmolarity is doubling in each reaction step. We can measure this in a conventional osmometer and you see that the osmolarity increases actually, of course, depending on the, on the concentration of this enzyme. And that, uh, for instance, at a concentration of 44 micro, uh, milligram per liter, we should get division after about 30 to 40 uh, minutes, because then we reach the osmolarity ratio of 1.41. And we can test this in experiments. So here you see how the division is actually happening in the presence of the invertase. And indeed, we get division after about 30 to 40 minutes. Um, we can also use a completely different system, namely photocleavable compounds, where we can trigger the division actually with light. Um, in this case, we use cage fluorescein, which is actually tripling the osmolarity in each reaction step, which means we can actually select one vesicle that we want to divide in a sea of many others, and we can obtain local division within seconds. Now, you may say, okay, um, after division, we have a single phase vesicles, obviously. So how should we divide them again if phase separation is actually what we need for division? And now I'm very grateful for the talk of Neha, which, uh, which came um, before, before, um, before me. So I don't need to explain in detail what we did here. We made use of DNA nanotechnology, just as, as Neha explained, to, make, to, to mimic kind of a zipper protein, a snare protein, which is inducing the fusion of the respectively other lipid types, so we can feed um, the vesicles with a lip, uh, with small unilamellar vesicles, SUVs of the respectively other other lipid type, and then we get fusion, and we get actually this is this is a quite reproducible process as you can see uh, in this image here. So quite a few vesicles are indeed phase separated after this, which in principle gives us a tool to actually make consecutive division cycles as well. Now, of course, you may argue that the requirement for phase separation is a constraint, right? So we thought, can we actually also obtain the division of single phase uh, GOVs? Now, what, what we still have is osmosis, right? We can also expose single phase GOVs to an osmotic pressure. And a theory tells us that if you do this, if you deflate vesicles, they can take on a variety of shapes. For instance, this, these uh, dumbbell shapes as shown here. Now, theory also tells us that we need a mechanism to overcome the energy barrier for fission. In the case of the phase separated vesicles, we made use of the line tension at the domain boundary. In the case of single phase vesicles, actually, you need uh, something else. And uh, Dimova and, and Steinkühler and Dipovsky, the group, showed that um, in, in theory and also experiments that we can actually use an increase of spontaneous curvature um, to, to overcome this energy barrier. Now, we quite like the, the mechanism for the local division that we can trigger with light. So we thought of a system where we can have this for single phase vesicles as well. And actually, it um, turns out that there is a molecule called uh, chlorine C6, C6, which is used as a photosynthesizer and also as an anti-tumor agent, which uh, self-assembles um, into the outer leaflet of the lipid membrane. And if you illuminate this uh, with blue light, then you get, uh, you get reactive oxygen species, which are actually inducing lipid peroxidation. And this lipid peroxidation now is basically selectively increasing um, the, the area of the outer leaflet, which leads to an effective spontaneous curvature, 
which we can use to actually uh, trigger the vision of single phase GOVs and do so basically locally. Um, and this we tested also in experiments again. First of all, we have to deflate the lipid vesicles, as you can see here. And then um, this, uh, this neck and the buds are forming. And if we then illuminate uh, the vesicle, then we get an increase and we get lipid peroxidation and increase in the spontaneous curvature, which ultimately leads to complete neck fission upon, um, upon illumination. So um, we can use this mechanism to, to also obtain the division of, of um, DNA containing vesicles, because if you ask me what's next, then obviously the integration of an information storage system should be next. So what you can see in this video is basically the division of a DNA containing vesicle. So this DNA is, uh, is, is shown here in blue. And of course, um, the integration of information storage by itself is not enough. So um, for, for me, the next step would really be to, to get a system where we have a link between information and somehow the, the phenotype or the morphology of a synthetic cell. Because if you think about it, actually evolution can, can only act on the phenotype, can only act on characteristics of a synthetic cell. And this for me would be one of the most exciting prospects of, of synthetic biology to actually get to a system which can uh, somehow evolve. So yeah, with this, I, I come to the, to the um, conclusion of my talk. Actually, I've shown you uh, two tools and that, I've, that we find very useful actually to go towards uh, engineering synthetic cells. And I've shown you two functions, namely a DNA-based cytoskeleton with which we could achieve the transport of, of lipid vesicles inside compartments and uh, the division of um, synthetic cells. And of course, uh, now we should all ask, when are we there, right? When will we actually have a synthetic cell that truly deserves its name? And I really hope that this is something that you'll be discussing on Friday. Um, and I'd be, I'd be very curious to hear what comes out of this. So with this, I should thank especially, of course, um, my group, all the people who, who did the work, especially Kevin Janke, who was working on the DNA-based cytoskeleton and the light-triggered division, as well as uh, Yannick Drea, who was working on the division and also the model of it, and uh, our collaborators, Laura Naliu and Peng Sei Tsan in, in Stuttgart, um, who, who helped us really to, to implement this DNA-based cytoskeleton. And of course, uh, I would like to thank you as well for, for your attention and also your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Kirsten, for a fantastic talk, real uh, tour de force uh, in bio-inspired bio um, chemistry, bio-inspired engineering. Um, we have a few questions. Um, first one is coming from Alicina Basrashan. Um, have you explored the effect of density on the, the track and the gold particle for motor function? Yes, so um, so actually the density, uh, the density on the track we did not modify, but what we did modify is actually the density um, of DNA strands with which we uh, code the particles. So for instance, in our case, the gold nanoparticle, the density of the DNA strands on the gold nanoparticle is much lower compared to the density of the DNA strands that we code on the SUV. And we actually see that a higher density of DNA is also leading to faster motion um, of the particle along the track, which is actually in agreement with also a very recent paper that came out that we just saw this week. So um, we are very happy about this, that this agrees. Um, Great. Um, uh, another question uh, along the same uh, part of your talk is from Neha Kamat. She, she asks, uh, well, she says, thanks for the great talk. And her question is, the movement of cargo nanoparticles, vesicles on the DNA cytoskeleton is very cool. Do you think you could get similar effect with invader strands instead of RNA cleavage? Um, so, in well, I mean, in principle, as long as we have, as long as we maintain this, uh, this burn bridge mechanism, so basically, as long as we are destructing the track, basically, then this should be possible. I mean, to, um, in principle, the dynamics of DNA strand displacement are, are always much, much slower. And the important aspect is, is really that we have a way to realize this burn bridge mechanism based on, based on DNA strand displacement, which I, um, which 
which one would have to think about. I don't have a I I don't have a solution right now, but I would imagine that the process is uh, is for sure slower. I would imagine so. Uh, thank you. Um, next question is from Tobias Erb. Uh, does the Reactive oxygen species-based GUV splitting always result in two equally smaller vesicles, or is there some stochasticity in this process? Um, so actually, um, actually, the the answer of this, uh, the, the answer to this question comes comes from theory. So it basically uh, depends on the osmolarity ratio to which you deflate the vesicles uh, in the first place, and this gives you a handle to steer this a little bit. So depending on on uh, to, depending on the ratio of the deflation, you if you deflate more, you tend to get more evenly sized butts, whereas if you if you deflate less, then you get more like uh, budding off a small uh, a small part of the vesicle, so to say. So this gives you a handle to actually tune this a little bit, whether you want even division or whether you want kind of um, yeah division where you have one big and one smaller compartment. Actually, the fact that this requires a lower osmolarity ratio may also be the reason why actually a spontaneous budding has been reported more more frequently in the literature. Um, it occurs more 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 spontaneously. Thank you. Uh, next question is from an anonymous attendee. How do you prevent diffusion of lipids in the UV activated region considering the time scale of vesicle diffusion? Um, how we prevent the... Um, how do you... I'm not sure about this question. Diffusion of lipids in the UV activated region. Ah, uh, yeah. I mean, we cannot prevent the diffusion of lipids at all. Um, we cannot prevent the diffusion of lipids at all. And um, the thing is, we don't need to actually illuminate locally. Um, we can increase the, it doesn't matter if you increase the spontaneous curvature for the entire lipid vesicle. It's also true that quite short illumination times of, of really seconds are, are sufficient for this. So um, it's actually possible to illuminate locally because the diffusion is not that fast. Um, but in principle, you don't need it. You can simply illuminate the entire GOV as well, or even place it under the UV lamp uh, and enter in bulk, so to say. Thank you. Uh, another question from an anonymous attendee. Can DNA act in, uh, I guess, can DNA generate force like protein version to divide the synthetic cell? And how can you measure the force? So I wish, <laughs> the answer is I wish. Um, it would be, of course, really, really, really nice to, to build force generating DNA based filaments. And for this, what we would need is some form of actually storing um, mechanical energy inside these filaments, right? So this would, I would say, be really a dream um, to, to make filaments which can grow in such a way that that mechanical strain is accumulating. And once you release the mechanical strain, you can you can actually generate a force. So this would be really cool. This is something that uh, we and many other people, I think, are, are, are thinking about. And it's really an, a great prospect of the field, I would say. Thank you. Next question is from Aisha Hamid. Is DNA divided equally in these vesicles or is it just an, an integration of biomolecules which divided as per the division of the size of the vesicle? Yeah, so I guess um, the question is referring to um, is referring to to this slide on the on the division of DNA containing uh, lipid vesicles, and what we have here is simply single stranded DNA and loads of it. So this means the single stranded DNA is just distributed evenly uh, inside the compartment before the division, and this means um, if we are just dividing the the vesicle, it's also divided fairly evenly, as you can also see in the confocal image after division. Um, this is, of course, nothing, not, not comparable to, to the division of, say, a chromosome, where we really get a very controlled, actually, um, division of the, of the two, two parts, but we still get even distribution. Great, thank you. Um, next question is coming from James Hindley. Fantastic talk. Regarding the division of single phase GUVs, how did you confirm that chlorine E6 was localized to a single leaflet of the membrane? It's a very good question. Um, so actually, um, so actually, I mean, 
one confirmation is the fact that actually the division works, right? Because if it was localized in both leaflets, which we actually do see happening over time a little bit, um, is uh, if we have if we have a C6 in both leaflets, then we shouldn't get division because we shouldn't get an increase in the spontaneous curvature if both leaflets are kind of increasing their area in the same way, right? Then you actually can't get division. And this is something we do see over time. So it seems like C6 is kind of distributing across both leaflets um, over time, which means that if we leave the vesicles incubate them with C6 for hours and hours, then uh, this division mechanism doesn't work anymore. So we really have to add it fresh so that it's only in the outer leaflet. And then, um, and then we get the increase in spontaneous curvature uh, or the increase in area selectively in the outer leaflet. And this is what is increasing the spontaneous curvature and actually making the division possible. Great, okay, uh, thank you. The final question is from Nicolas Dolder and uh, um, he's asking, could one also use proteins or DNA origami to introduce spontaneous curvature for the division of vesicles without phase separation to avoid lipid peroxidation? I'm, I'm pretty sure this is possible. Yeah, I mean, uh, attaching, attaching a DNA strand uh, to the outer leaflet of the membrane should, should increase its spontaneous curvature. In fact, this, uh, this is very similar to what uh, Steinkühler et al. did um, in their Nature Communications paper, where they actually attached a protein to the outer leaflet of the membrane and used this to induce, uh, induce division. What you don't have then is actually a mechanism to induce division locally, right, which we wanted to have in, in this case. But for sure, this should also be possible to, to do it with, uh, with DNA. Um, Again, but, but I, I, what I should add is that the lipid peroxidation is actually not such a big problem because what happens after the area increase, the initial area increase, is actually that the lipid tails get cleaved off and that the lipids are excluded from the membrane so that we think most likely we have a vesicle with zero spontaneous curvature in the end again. So, and uh, since in every cycle, only a few of the lipids actually undergo lipid peroxidation, um, I think it's not so much of an, of an issue, at least, at least for us at the moment. Okay, uh, great. Thank you so much uh, for this great presentation. And I am happy that you were able to work through the, your introduction, your interruption, um, and that uh, there was no subsequent problems. Uh, Thank you so much. And sorry again for the, for the troubles uh, for falling was, out. Thanks, Jacqueline, for, for taking over spontaneously. It was a great recovery there. Um, so um, really nice work. Um, uh, we will take a break now. Um, we will reconvene at, uh, at the top of the hour, uh, 10 a.m. Mountain Daylight Time, uh, 6 p.m. Central European Time. Um, we will have a, our second session starting then. Um, our, my colleague, Bruna Jacobson will be taking over as moderator and we'll have talks by Matthew Good, Matt Lakin, and Alicina Basrapshan. And we will also have uh, another poster session. Um, so, Please uh, stay tuned and uh, take a little break. Uh, um, stretch, your, stretch your limbs and uh, please join us back here in about um, eight minutes. Thank you.
Should I share my, my screen? Uh, yes, yes, sir. Okay. Sorry, yeah, go ahead, Bruna, whenever you want. Okay, welcome to the second session of the first day of talks of the CINCEL conference. My name is Bruna Jacobson, and I am an assistant professor in the computer science department at the University of New Mexico. We'll have three talks in the session, starting with a 15 minute con uh, contributed talk that will be followed by five minutes of discussion. And the audience, as before, may use the Q&A function on Zoom to ask questions. So our first speaker is Dr. Matthew Good. He's an assistant professor in the Cell and Developmental Biology Bioengineering um, from the University of Pennsylvania. And he's going to tell us about synthetic membraneless organelles for modular control of cell decision making. OK, thank you for the intro. Hopefully, the screen is sharing. Um, I'm excited to be part of this event. Uh, and thank you to the organizers. I look forward to hearing more of her today and the next few days. So today I'm gonna to talk about designing characterization of uh, synthetic organelles. Thus far in this weekly seminar series, we've heard a lot about bottom-up assembly of bio-inspired materials such as artificial organelles and biomimetic behaviors such as synthetic cell motility. And my group's really been in interested in building designer chemical compartments inside living cells uh, using polymer building blocks that are genetically encoded and to leverage these synthetic compartments for programmable control of cell decision making. So um, our goal really was to build a protein based switch um, that could be characterized by chemically first ex vivo. Um, and then also we wanted a controller that would respond quickly in time compared to, for example, a traditional gene circuit and one that might allow multiple cycles of uh, input output responses. And conceptually, you know, we think of the synthetic organelle uh, functionally as being able to either sequester and insulate biochemical pathways in the cell or to concentrate components in a bioreactor scheme. So there's a number of platforms one could consider for constructing genetically encoded artificial organelles. Uh, you can think of nano compartments such as the encapsulin and protein nano cages we really took inspiration from natural systems. Um, and so we all know cells consist not only of subcellular compartments bounded by lipid bilayer membranes, uh, but they contain numerous protein rich bodies termed membraneless organelles. And these are thought to form through the coacervation of proteins and RNAs into micron length scale uh, biomolecular condensates. So a fundamental principle at play here is that disordered polypeptides uh, when above their critical concentrations will self-assemble via weak multivalent interactions into mesoscale protein condensates that function as membraneless organelles. So uh, purifying a recombinant disordered protein in vitro, uh, it will undergo liquid-liquid phase separation above its critical concentration to generate turbid solutions at the macro scale uh, and protein condensates at the micro scale. And one major question is always which IDP scaffold to use, uh, which disordered polymer sequence to select for engineering membraneless organelles. We chose the RGG domain from LAF1. This is a model disordered protein our group's been characterizing in engineering. Um, and it forms, uh, normally in cells, it forms structures called, the, called P granules in embryonic cells. And in particular, the 168 amino acid disordered internal region uh, is necessary and sufficient for, for liquid droplet formation in vitro. So in a study we published last year with the Metal Lab, we used computational modeling and in vitro reconstitution to identify sequence rules for condensation of the LAF1 RGG domain. Uh, and I wanna tell you about three features. So we identified a conserved 10 amino acid patch, uh, which is required for a high transition temperature. Um, and we demonstrated the importance of arginine and tyrosine interactions via turbidity assays in vitro. So for example, mutation of all of the arginine silicine will completely abrogate the ability of this polymer to phase separate. Uh, and then also by shuffling the sequence without altering its composition, we predictively tuned the critical temperature for phase separation, for example, raising it up to 50 Celsius without changing the material properties. And collectively between our studies and those of others, we're, we're starting to understand a variety of types of homotypic polymer-polymer interactions that drive protein-protein condensation and protein nucleic acid con uh, condensation. So additionally, in previous work, we've showed that this RGG domain is an excellent kind of base platform for controlled condensation in vitro. Uh, increased valency of the RGG domain tunes phase behavior. Uh, so the critical temperature will increase as a function of valency shown in these turbidity plots. 
And we initially used enzymatic regulation to reduce valency and dissolve condensates or to remove a tag to trigger de novo droplet formation. We also showed that these condensates have selective permeability um, that's largely protein size dependent. And then to specifically recruit and concentrate uh, targeted cargos, we added short peptide interaction motifs to the scaffold and client uh, in vitro. So more recently, we've embedded light-based regulatory controls into this RGG sequence to, to create optically responsive polymers uh, that assemble inside protocells in vitro. And so on the left is the system called split, which responds to photocleavage of the encoded focal tag uh, and mediates condensation inside uh, cell-like compartments. Uh, and on the right is real-time modulation of IDP valency, uh, which we use to jump across the phase boundary. All right, so in new studies uh, under revision, um, what I really wanna tell you about is how we've kind of moved from in vitro characterization to deploy these RGG-based condensates as designer compartments in living cells to insulate uh, native enzymes and enable modular control of cell behavior. So there's a number of interesting um, existing, excuse me, synthetic condensate platforms. I'm not gonna have time to review them here. Really what we sought to do was engineer a platform to achieve a number of functions that are not available in these off the shelf systems. And these strategies that are likely generalizable to other IDR systems as well. And so a major aim was to characterize variants with low critical concentration to ensure that a vast majority of the scaffold was partitioned to the condensate. We wanted to sel selectively and efficiently recruit native clients. So we tested a number of short interaction tags and used CRISPR to knock them into the, the native gene locus. Uh, and because this is a protein switch, we wanted to achieve rapid induced client recruitment and controlled release. And all of this for the purpose of de demonstrating functional switching between cell activity states uh, using these synthetic organelles. So we first repeated our tests of temperature stability as a function of RGG domain valency. Um, just as a reminder, these are the transition temperatures from increasing of RGG valency in vitro. So we added a GFP tag and expressed these in an industrial model organism in budding yeast. And the tandem or excuse me, the single only forms tiny puncta and only cooling to four degrees Celsius. The tandem nicely forms condensates at room temp, but these are dissolved as you raise the temperature. And then the triple is highly temperature resistant, so it's stable even at 42C, which is a feature we thought would be really useful for combining these condensates with temperature dependent interaction motifs. Um, and I should mention the triple RGG condensates are still highly dynamic and liquid-like as shown from photo bleaching and droplet fusion experiments. So our second goal was to characterize protein interaction tags for selective recruitment of the client. Really our goal is to achieve 90% sequestration or knockdown of the pool of this native protein in the cell. Uh, and so we tested short synzip tags and thermally responsive coil coils from the bacterial thermosensor TLPA. Um, and so uh, for microscopy data on the top, you can see the green channel showing expression of the scaffold that it forms condensates. And in the second row, the client is strongly recruited to these condensates uh, as evidence from the merge. Uh, the left is the synzip coils and the right are the TLPA coils. Um, and what I hope you can see is that there's likely some modest homotypic affinity, which then leads to elevated fusion information of a single condensate um, uh, with this triple RGG in the TLPA. Uh, but what's important is that the scaffold and client partitioning is highly effective. So we achieve nearly 95% of the scaffold uh, partitioned to the condensate and over 90% of an exogenous, an exogenously expressed client partitioned to the condensate. All right, so coming back to this first question about critical concentration, we characterize it directly uh, in cells demonstrating the importance of increased valency in the TLPA tag. So here are a number of these different RGG valency with different tags. And so the single RGG is uh, on the left side of the phase boundary, it doesn't condense. The tandem has a critical concentration of about two micromolar. The triple further lowers this to about 0.6 micromolar. And then addition of the TLPA tag further lowers it. You can see this, this is the same data just separated uh, on a log scale. And so we achieve a critical concentration of below 30 nanomolar, which is why at one micromolar expression, we, we, we should achieve 95% partition. So to test the ability of these condensates to sequester and functionally insulate native clients and cells, we targeted a number of enzymes that control both sides of the cell cycle control system, including the kinase CDC5 and the uh, GEF CDC24. And the idea is that normally flux through the pathway, uh, 
uh, should occur without the condensate, but then would be blocked by sequestering uh, one of the pathway members to the, to the synthetic condensate. So we genomically integrated into the native gene locus, a fluorophore, uh, and a portion of the TLPA tag. This is a heterodimeric dimeric pair we term TSCCA and B. Um, and normally the GEF CDC24 is localized to the cell cortex, as you can see in the images on the right, um, at polarized bud sites, and the kinase CDC5 uh, is localized to the spindle pole body. Um, however, when you express the scaffold form condensates, the enzymes are displaced from their native subcellular localizations, as you can see in this image, and they're sequestered to our synthetic organelle. Uh, and the sequestration is efficient. In both cases, we achieve 80 to 85 percent of the total pool of the native enzyme partition of the condensate, and this means five to six fold decrease in its uh, concentration or cytosolic availability. So what's really important is that sequestration to the condensates acts to functionally insulate the enzyme from its partners. Uh, and this impacts signaling through the cell cycle control system. So shown here are spot dilution assays. On the left are growth conditions where there's not expression of the condensates and on the right uh, where we have transcriptional induction of scaffold expression to form condensates. The top row is CDC24 and the bottom is CDC5. And so what I want to show you is that the scaffold alone, tag scaffold alone or tag client alone, these cells grow completely normally. Um, but when you combine them together, then this completely abrogates cell growth. This is true for CDC24 on the top or CDC5 on the bottom. And we can also see this clearly uh, through the increase in cell cycle arrest uh, when you combine them together or the tenfold drop in cell proliferation rates in, in, in liquid culture. And so the take home point is that the synthetic organelles and the tagging of native enzymes is a highly effective strategy for switching on or off a pathway of interest. So because we set out to use these organelles as protein based switches, we also wanted to engineer regulatory handles to allow rapid real-time control of client sequestration and controlled release. Um, and so for induced client recruitment, we followed the same strategy as showed you, but uh, we tagged with FRB and FKPP domains to, to allow dimerization in response to rapamycin. Um, and so prior to the addition of uh, dimerize, the client's diffuse, and then afterwards uh, it becomes concentrated in these synthetic organelles. Uh, the kinetics are rapid, so you can see that we get about 50% of the client recruited in 10 minutes. Um, and importantly, this induced client sequestration has a strong functional effect, so it completely shuts down growth in the presence of rapamycin. But again, only if the dimerizer is present and only if the condensates are expressed. So it's rapid, highly selective, and efficient at switching cells from a proliferative to an arrested state. All right, so for controlled release of clients uh, insulated to the synthetic organelle, we, we engineered two strategies. On the left, uh, a reversible strategy for client release using the thermally responsive co coils. So these are dimerized at 25, but then dissociated at 42. And on the right, an irreversible optogenetic strategy that uses photocleavable protein to, to remove the client uh, recruitment tag. So our experimental setup um, includes uh, a period of induction of the scaffold to form condensates and sequester the client, thus leading to uh, increased arrest. And then uh, reversal of this process, uh, uh, re-entry into the cell cycle by release of the enzyme. And indeed, we see that cells are arresting at 25C, uh, increasing their arrest over the first six hours, and then they continue to arrest if the temperature is kept at 25. However, we see a really nice dose-dependent drop uh, or reversal of this arrest. Uh, here's 37 and here's 42. Um, uh, 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 so showing the thermal reversal of this phenotype. Uh, and this reversal can be maintained overnight at the same temperatures, demonstrating that these temperature manipulations are compatible with cell function. Uh, and we also quantified client release. And although it's not complete, uh, we release about a third of the client back into the cytosol, which is uh, sufficient to boost its concentration and reactivate signaling. So I think what's neat is that we can also reverse this uh, arrest imposed by the synthetic organelle sequestering CDC24 using an optogenetic strategy. Um, uh, so the experimental setup is the same as, uh, as before, except that at four hours, uh, we expose the cells to a 10 minute pulse of 405 nanometer light. Um, and what we observe is a near complete switching back to normal. So again, the uh, scaffold is induced here. And then at four hours, as we're arresting the cells, we give them this pulse of light and this nearly fully reverses the arrest from uh, this optical uh, strategy. 
And to demonstrate that we can do more than one cycle of client sequestration and, and release, we subjected the cells to a cyclical pattern of temperature switching. Uh, and indeed, we observed switching from four states from this kind of wild type, normally growing about 50% arrested state, to then nearly fully arrested, reversal, uh, and then re-sequestered by shifting the temperatures. So finally, to demonstrate the generalizability of this platform, uh, we formed condensates in mammalian U2S cells in CRISPR tag native gene loci for a variety of enzymes, showing here microscopy for RAC1 um, that we can uh, uh, concentrate it, uh, enrich it within these condensates. Uh, and this is selective because the same scaffold, but expressed with the wrong coil, coil tag, will not recruit it. Uh, and this partitioning is efficient. So we can sequester about half of the RAC1, um, and we've demonstrated this with RAC1, ERK1, uh, and some other polarity proteins. All right, so to close, we'd really like to leverage these synthetic organelles for a number of applications in cellular engineering and medicine. Um, I've shown you that we can control cell signaling. We're also trying to target transcription factors that regulate cell fate, so to shift the decision between cell renewal and cell differentiation. Um, and so I'm going to wrap up here and say that our aim has really been to design novel coacervating protein materials that function as synthetic organelles. Um, that we can start by uh, designing or characterizing computationally and biophysically and then deploy them in cells. Um, I showed you that some of the engineering goals, for example, to achieve uh, highly efficient uh, uh, sequestering of the scaffold, we need a low CSAT, uh, a strategy for, for targeting native enzymes to achieve high recruitment, uh, control of cell behaviors, um, and uh, ultimately uh, two strategy for controlled release to, to, to reverse this process. So with that, uh, I'm gonna wrap up, acknowledge the members of my lab, particularly Mikhail and Wental who carried out this work as well as their collaborators in the Hammer and the Mittal lab. Uh, I wanna acknowledge funding and then take questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Good. That was a great talk. Um, there are no questions yet on the Q&A, but I, I do have a quick question on um, uh, the, you have a number of RGG domains there yes. uh, tagged. And um, have you looked at the, uh, if you separate them by introducing more um, sequences in between those RGG domains, do you observe a difference in the phase behavior? Or is it just the number of RGG domains that, that have an influence on the phase? Yeah, so these disordered sequences, we just put uh, we construct together with like a 10 amino acid glycerolinker. Um, we have put fluorophores and recruitment tags between the domains. Um, that does not seem to kind of change the critical concentration, but there is an effect of adding folded domains. So if you start to raise the amount of folded protein that's on the scaffold, then you, you steadily raise the, the critical concentration. Um, and certainly you can mix and match different IDRs to achieve different behaviors and material properties of the condensates. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question from uh, Gabriel Lopez, and he says, beautiful work. Have you looked at enzyme catalysis, uh, for instance, turnover when uh, sequestered versus released? So I guess there's two answers to that question. In our sequestration strategy here, um, have we looked at rates of, of signaling, um, We've not directly looked at, for example, the target of CDC24, the GTPA CDC42. So we could look at its, um, its GTP loaded state. Uh, we have, or we are looking at the rates of signaling with ERK1 sequestration in mammalian cells. Uh, but I think your question might be, can we accelerate reactions by co-localizing components? And so maybe I'll just uh, show an example of that. Um, so the Jared Todekers lab has done this with exogenous enzymes, localizing them to plus LC condensates. Um, and uh, the Lemke lab has done this for non-natural amino acid incorporation. And so indeed, enforcing the proximity of components raising their local concentration um, should accelerate the reaction. Really the study I told you about today was uh, an attempt to achieve you know, high level control of native cell behaviors. Um, but we do think that yes, we could accelerate these reactions as well. And one more question from the Q&A. Uh, uh, Daniela Bittencourt, she asks, uh, have you tried to use other natural polymers as scaffold for organelle development? Yeah, so 
we, we played around with a number of IDR sequences. I think the most commonly used one in the literature right now um, uh, uses the N-terminal low complexity domain of FUS. So we've, we've used that as well. It has a nuclear localization signal. Um, so one of the reasons we've, we've really focused on the RGG domain is because it's cytosolic. Um, and in our studies, it's orthogonal, so it doesn't affect cell growth. Um, but yeah, there's many, many that can be used. Um, uh, you can use PD-1. Um, uh, basically, any strategy with an IDR and a multimerization can be used to generate a compartment. And so I don't want to say that, I, I hope the takeaway is not just that the LAF-1 RGG domain is the only IDR sequence you should use, but generally that these strategies um, of uh, doing your own engineering to lower CSATs, of adding short interaction motifs to achieve high levels of partitioning, um, and then strategies for reversing or recruiting clients. Those are really the the points that are important. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Unfortunately, there are a couple more questions in the Q&A, but we are out of time. So I encourage uh, the questioners to email the, uh, the presenter. Uh, thank you very much for the beautiful talk. Uh, we'll move on to our next talk is um, a featured talk in this session. It's our uh, 30 minute talk followed by 10 minutes of discussion. And it's a pleasure to introduce my colleague, Dr. Matthew Lakin, Assistant Professor in the Computer Science Department at the University of New Mexico. He's also affiliated with the UNM Center for Biomedical Engineering and the UNM Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering. He conducts research on the design and experimental realization of biomolecular computing systems with research interests spanning DNA technology, synthetic biology, and com computation modeling design and simulation. Dr. Lakin collaborates with researchers at the UNM Health Science Center, as well as with his former colleagues at Microsoft Research. And he was recently just awarded the NSF Career Award and the UNM School of Engineering Junior Faculty Research Excellence Award. So his talk today is entitled Information Processing Synthetic Cells. Matt Lakin, thank you for being here with us. Thank you very much, Bruna, um, for the introduction. Hopefully you can hear me all right and see my screen. Um, so, um, yeah, so today I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, some uh, work uh, done by, by myself and my group over, over recent years um, on, um, I guess, information processing in uh, biomolecular systems, um, broadly construed with a potential application to synthetic cells. Um, and um, I just like to thank the, the workshop for inviting me to give this talk. Um, it's great to be able to share what we've been doing with, with this uh, synthetic cell community, a community that I'm a bit of a, a newcomer to, I would say. Um, so um, my background is in computer science. I'm a computer scientist, and so I, uh, uh, but I also do have a wet lab. I split my time between uh, UNM Computer Science on the left here and uh, UNM Center for Biomedical Engineering um, uh, on the right. So I wanted to just start today by um, just talking a little bit about uh, synthetic cell uh, field, I guess, as I, as I sort of perceive it as a little bit of a, as a, a newcomer, I guess. Um, and there's a lot of great work that, that we've seen um, over, over recent years, and, and a lot of it has been, um, has been presented in, 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 in this, this workshop and in the talk series leading up to this workshop on mimicking various aspects of life in, in, in bottom-up synthetic cell systems. So that includes things like DNA replication, uh, a formation of cytoskeleton and cell division. We saw talks on these two things just this morning, um, and other, other other aspects of of cellular behavior, such as metabolism and uh, and photosynthesis and so forth. Um, and um, but sort of the, the the sort of the the direction that I come from from on to this from is 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 slightly different, um, which is I guess the uh, an interest in uh, sort of behavior in a, in a broader sense. Um, and so I, um, I sort of took the idea for this slide from uh, Clyde Hutchison's uh, uh, talk on the, the, the Ventnor Institute uh, synthetic cell, again, during, during this workshop's uh, talk series, um, where you know, he made it very clear that their, their work is focusing on, in, in large part, on the core functions uh, for a, a synthetic cell or, or a minimal cell to be considered alive. So what is the minimum you need to be able to survive in a particular control environment to metabolize certain things and, and replicate and so forth. And then he drew a, a distinction between this and sort of everything else that, 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 that living cells do, which, are, which he sort of called the, coined, called the adaptive functions. 
And this is kind of where I, uh, you know, where, where this talk is sort of focused, um, which is kind of less, so it's slightly different, it's less about how can we rec recapitulate some of the curl functions, but thinking about how could we maybe recapitulate some of the adaptive functions uh, that you know, would enable uh, synthetic cells to survive in more general environments than, than, the, um, than the sort of the most controlled ones. And um, we can draw inspiration for this from, uh, from, from nature. So there are you know, a, a many, many unicellular organisms right, implement very, uh, very complex behaviors. Um, there's many examples of this. I kind of just wanted to briefly focus on one that's going to relate to the things we talked about later. Um, and uh, it's uh, an organism that was studied quite a lot in, in the early, uh, early years of, of microbiology called Stentor. And this is essentially a large uh, 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 ciliate, uh, unicellular eukaryotic organism. Um, and uh, it looks like this kind of trumpet shape. It likes to attach itself to the surface. And if you stimulate it, right, so in this case, this is an image from one of his early papers in the very early 20th century, uh, you know, stimulating it with some noxious chemical, it will do one of a number of things to get away. It will either try and bend itself um, away from the stimulus as shown here, or it will do one of another things. It will bend, it will try and reverse its cilia to get rid of the, the, the irritant. Uh, it will con may contract, or ultimately it may sort of attach itself and, and, and float off. And so these early researchers, who, this is obviously before, um, before, long before the structure of DNA was discovered, long before uh, molecular biology had really taken hold, were kind of exploring this behavior, right? And they were saying, well, what happens, you know, it, it, how does this cell behave in response to these different stimuli? In particular, what happens if you stimulate the, a cell a number of times? And one of the things that um, was found quite early on was that the behavior sort of changed over time, it wasn't always fixed. And there was a quote in, in this book from 1905 that said, the resolution of one physiolog physiological state into another becomes easier and more rapid after it has taken place a number of times. And obviously at that point, there wasn't really a, a detailed molecular uh, understanding of the basis behind this, but the idea was, and it's, and, and it's actually claimed in this, these cells are somehow learning from their, their, um, from their experience or at least mod modifying their behavior uh, in response to their experience. And more recent work uh, on this particular organism um, came a couple of years ago, uh, certainly confirmed the fact that they do behave differently if you keep stimulating. This is an example from uh, this paper in 2019, uh, which showed that, well, if you take one of these uh, organisms, and this is now some you know, microscopy um, uh, being done on them, and then you, you, you stimulate it once, it bends away, it comes back, you stimulate it again, it sort of contracts, tries to hide, and then, and then detaches itself. So and these cells are changing their uh, responses to the stimulus over time. And to the broadening it beyond, um, beyond this particular organism, there have been various other organisms studied over the years where people have claimed, well, these cells can do things uh, akin to, to, to learning. So paramecia, and one of the most sort of um, probably well-known of these, physarum polycephalum slime mold, as kind of shown here. Um, uh, which has been shown to be able to sort of habituate itself, sort of learn to uh, ignore this barrier in order to get to a, to a food source. Um, and so th these, these claims are, you know, it's worth, worth, worth noting, a you know, disclaimer, many of these claims have been somewhat contested. So, um, you know, there are papers that say these cells are doing this, they're learning, and there are cells, papers that say, well, no, they're not. Um, and I'll sort of come back to that um, on, on the next slide. Um, but the point sort of I want to make is, well, if we're thinking about this as a sort of a synthetic cell engineer, how might we go about implementing similar behaviors in synthetic cells to create synthetic cells that sort of do not just, uh, you know, do not, do not just survive, but also thrive in some sense. And I guess the claim that I would sort of make or put forward here is that um, implementing such behaviors will require some form of information processing to go on, which may not, may not be that, um, it may not be that, um, and controversial, I suppose, but so uh, conceptually, you can imagine it's something like this, where you have a little synthetic cell, it's a vesicle of some kind, and it's got some stuff in it that is um, able to process information. And I'm kind of, sort of not going to commit right now on what that stuff is, um, and it receives some stimulus from the outside, and then produces a response um, based on uh, you know sensing response, as we kind of all know that cells do. Uh, but then, in addition, in response to that that stimulus. There may be some further uh, processing going on that updates the state of this of this of this synthetic cell. So I I had these little M's here, M for memory, and then 
maybe the stimulus creates additional memory of some form in the form of some uh, you know, molecular, um, 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 molecular representation of that memory. So the next time the stimulus is observed, the cell behaves differently. Maybe, uh, maybe it produces a stronger response. Maybe it produces, a, as shown here, maybe it produces a weaker response. Maybe it produces a completely different response as we saw in the case of the, the stentor. But, um, but there's some kind of information processing needs to go on. And one of the, uh, you know, I'm going back to the point on the previous slide, one of the advantages of a, of a synthetic cell platform for doing this type of research, or a minimal cell platform, I suppose, is that you greatly cut down the other potential uh, explanations right, for why this behavior is changing in, 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 this, in this work on naturally occurring organisms. Um, there's always the, the worry that, well, maybe the cell is changing in some other way, but is not really learning the stimulus. Maybe, maybe there's some evolutionary change happening that maybe wouldn't happen in, in a synthetic cell, or at least in the current sort of incarnations of synthetic cells as we, um, as, as, we, as we see them today. So I guess that's kind of the motivation. The question now becomes, well, how could we implement this? And specifically, I suppose, what might this cloud actually be? Um, and in a lot of the talks that we've seen, you know, the, the cloud has been some kind of gen you know, gen genetic circuit that is doing something in response to, to stimuli. Um, here, you know, that, that's something that, that my group works on also, but for, for today, I wanted to talk about something slightly different, which is um, an alternative way to implement such uh, signal processing uh, via um, DNA-based molecular computing. And we talked a little bit about this uh, in uh, uh, Dr. Gottfried's talk, um, but I'm gonna go over it again for, uh, for my own sake. So this is a, an image of an artistic rendering of, a, of DNA-based molecular computing in, in, in action. Um, and so what we're talking about here is uh, DNA-based uh, uh, molecular computing components that are made of short DNA oligos um, annealed together and to form particular structures. And they compute on data that is represented as concentrations of certain free strands. So there are certain, so strands can be free, they can be bound to other strands. And the state of the system we're going to claim is, 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 is represented by the concentrations of the free strands. And um, the, the fact that this is DNA means that we can abstract certain things. So we, you know, if we design a molecular structure, we can abstract it as secondary structure, we can abstract it as sequence domains and, 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 and so forth. I perhaps don't need to belabor that point uh, uh, here as, as much as I might in, in some, other, uh, some other settings. But this is what we're doing. And how does that computation happen? It happens by a process alluded to um, earlier of DNA strand displacement. And uh, basically that works like this. So we have an input, um, uh, which in this case is this, this uh, short single strand uh, shown in green that binds to this complex via a complementary toehold. So these toeholds are over short overhangs, single stranded that nucleate these binding, right? And then enable subsequent reactions to take place. And those subsequent reactions are shown in the middle here, which is this branch migration, which is essentially a competitive hybridization, where the green and the red here are basically competing over who gets to bind to the blue uh, complementary strand on, on, on the bottom. And if this uh, run, and this is a random walk, it, just, it goes back and forth. But if it gets to the far end and you get to the, the, the state on the, on the right here, output B is released and, uh, and sort of you're left with complex Y. This example is, is irreversible, um, or considered irreversible because there's no toehold on this complex Y. Um, but in, in, in general, you could have a toehold there to make this more interesting and have the process go, be able to go back in reverse as well. And so from the, from, the, from the perspective of the free strands, we've removed an A from the, the, free, the set of free strands in solution and replaced it with a B. Now the A hasn't disappeared and the B hasn't appeared from nowhere. It's just that what was free is now bound and what was bound is now free. And this is gonna be a general purpose uh, uh, building block that we can use to build up more interesting systems. So I'm gonna uh, talk here about um, abstract uh, chemical reactions. And when I say I'm talking about abstract chemical reactions, I'm in interested in using these as a high level tool with which to design these systems. Um, and uh, these are, the, we, so we, we can write down these sets of reactions that we would like to happen with certain reaction rates, certain uh, reactants and products. And these are not real chemical species in a sense, they're just names that I've made up, but they have a connection to the real uh, via DNA strand displacement, 
um, and via this uh, elegant result of uh, Soloveitchik et al, who basically showed when you can take any such chemical reaction system and convert it into a DNA strand displacement network that gives the same behavior or, or, or a pro uh, arbitrarily well approximates the behavior essentially. And essentially it does that by converting these uh, abstract species that I just made up uh, into uh, different single strands of DNA and then adds additional uh, 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 additional DNA complexes, uh, like we saw on the previous slide, to mediate those interactions. And if you do this, you can, you, for every reaction in your network, you can, you can build up a DNA strand displacement implementation of any system. So for instance, um, uh, these reactions, these chemical reactions here can be converted into these DNA reactions and, uh, and then simulated, and they give the behavior of this, of this oscillator. So whenever I present something with made up chemical species, you have in your back in your mind, well, this could be, in principle at least, compiled um, into a DNA circuit and then, and then built in the lab. So um, I'm going to talk, I guess, for the rest of the time about a number of projects in my group that are related to this line of research, specifically, um, how can we imp in implement some of these uh, interesting behaviors, interesting algorithms, such as learning uh, in various kinds of DNA circuit, or chemical reaction network. And then uh, at the very end, I'll talk a little bit about how uh, my, some of the experimental work that my group's been going on on, on, on on that end of things. So the first part, first little sort of um, thing I want to mention is um, work done by my grad student, David Ardondo, which is on uh, learning in abstract chemical reaction networks. And the goal of this, of this work is to implement a trainable two-layer nonlinear artificial neural network has a abstract CRM. Um, and this is, the, this, is the, this is a very simple neural network for those of you who have any idea about machine learning, where there are hundreds of layers and hundreds of nodes per layer. This is very simple, very small. We've got two nodes in the first layer, uh, what two neurons I should say in the first layer, one in the second layer, um, and then the, 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 um, the connections between them obviously will have weights between them, and then there's an output at the far end. And the individual neurons look like this. They take inputs, they weight them, they, they compute the weighted sum, they pass it through a nonlinear a non uh, transfer function. In this case, nonlinear transfer function is the hyperbolic tangent, which basically squashes everything into the into the into the, uh, the region between minus one and one. And so we are first, um, and so basically what, what we did was to come up with a chemical reaction network implementation that approximates this approximates its behavior not just in the forward direction of computing an output, but also in the reverse direction of uh, feeding back the uh, error in the output relative to a goal in order to train the, the network to produce a specific, um, to I guess, uh, implement a specific behavior. And so in this, in this, in this CRN, we present the whole thing, but I can give it basically an overview. We use a molecular oscillator, kind of like the similar, in, in, in spirit, at least, to the oscillators that control uh, the cell cycle to organize the reactions into a number of phases. And then those, those um, species are used as catalysts to drive different reactions in different phases. Uh, so the first phase, basically uh, shown here, is essentially computing the first uh, layer neuron output. Then the second layer neuron output is computed. And then at the bottom, these reactions are feeding back from that to, um, to modify the weights. And the example of this one is weight W01, which you can show so it starts here. And then in response to the training, it's modified a little bit um, to like, essentially this dotted line, which is, which is on there to indicate where we expect the weight should go. Um, so how does that feedback mechanism take place? Well, the feedback mechanism takes place via this um, uh, algorithm that we came up with, uh, which is essentially a uh, a weight perturbation algorithm for machine learning. And so what we have is we have our, our, our inputs and we have our weights. And um, what the CRN does is it copies these um, inputs and weights into two different versions of the network, um, one of which has the, the weight slightly perturbed. So one of the weights is the, the weight slightly different. And that will give you a slightly different output. And if you um, Compute the, the the output, or in this case the, the error, the loss under these under these two conditions, then you can essentially compute what you need to compute for um, 
uh, for training, which is the partial derivative of the loss with respect to that weight. And that is, that is just given by um, finite difference methods like this. And so the network basically computes both of these top two terms, subtracts them away, and that gives it the, um, the, the change in that weight that needs to occur, which is then passed around this feedback to update uh, one of the weights. And what, that, what those weights are, are just certain chemical uh, species in the network, um, as shown here, uh, and their concentrations are either increased or decreased. I've got negative concentrations here because we use a dual rail representation, which is essentially there are two species per, per signal, one positive, one negative, and the difference between them gives you this actual concentration value. So that's how we can have concentration values going negative. And so we use this to train um, uh, the to train in networks for to implement all 16 of the two input boolean functions. Um, they're shown here. Uh, I want to quickly pick out XOR. So XOR is kind of the most interesting of these because it's the most difficult to learn. It's not linearly separable, um, which means you probably need the two layers. You can't just do it in a single layer. And um, this system is indeed able to learn it in this decision surface. So when both of the inputs are off or both are on, you get, you get um, minus one, which we call sort of off. And then when both of them are, when precisely one of them is on, then you get the input, output being high, which is sort of what we want. So we can, we, can, we can design the CRN and we can train it to implement these, um, uh, these behaviors. And um, you know, that, that's, the that's the first example and most abstract example, I suppose, of how this could be used in a synthetic cell. Um, secondly, um, I want to mention some work that I did um, with a colleague at UNM, Darko Stefanovic, on um, implementing uh, learning behavior in uh, a simulated strand displacement network. So going sort of a step down and actually converting, uh, coming up with a version of this that is actually using um, simulated strand displacement reactions. And um, our starting point for this is um, what we call buffered strand displacement. And this is essentially a, an, uh, a, a framework for, for designing strand displacement gates in which the gates are initially inactive as shown at the top here. Um, so they don't accept input until they've been unbuffered by this initial input here that we call B. And that produces a gate where this blue toe hold is free that can then uh, accept a reactant X as, a, as input. And when that happens, you get this intermediate that interacts with a second gate to produce the output. And those outputs are the, are the products, which in this case is another X and a Y, and also crucially a new unbuffering strand which can come back and reactivate a new gate. And this is a mechanism by which the population of active gates stabilizes itself over time. But by producing new, new Bs, you can activate new gates from the buffer. And so we use this uh, to implement a, a tunable amplifier system um, whereby if we take the two reactions, X goes to X plus Y and X goes to nothing, which are essentially competitive on X, um, and we, and we um, implement them with two different buffer species, B and B prime, then this function is an amplifier that multiplies the input X into the output Y by some uh, ratio W, by some, uh, I guess, weight W, which is the ratio of the, of the species B and B prime. And this is just shown on the left here. And initially we set the weight to two and then uh, providing one, one, you know, one concentration unit of, of input X gives us two concentration units of Y. If I bump the weight up to five, then providing one input jumps the, uh, the output from two to seven, in other words, a multiple of, of, of five. So this thing can be tuned as a linear amplifier. And so we can use this briefly to learn uh, linear, uh, to, to, to learn linear functions. Um, and this is the training algorithm, which um, <coughs> rather than perturbing the weights and computing the, the loss um, um, sort of indirectly, here we compute the loss directly because we're using a slightly simpler uh, we're, we're using slightly simpler um, functional form that we're trying to learn, just these uh, weighted sums, which means we can more easily compute um, the weight updates directly and then apply them. And these, these figures on the right here just show some, um, just show some um, uh, updates of these weights. The reds are our are, are, are DNA system as we simulate, and the black is as a reference implementation of our um, of our algorithm, and the bottom left just shows how if we do more training, then on average the weights get better, which is what you would expect. And so this is again a slightly more concrete example of how 
we can implement a learning al algorithm, in this case, using an actual strand displacement implementation of the CRM that we, um, that we, that we design uh, sort of directly. I guess I have about five minutes left. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about experimental, um, experimental work related to this. Um, and I'll first want to talk about some uh, work by um, a grad student in my, in my, my group, Tracy Millet. And this is on using uh, building DNA, DNA circuits uh, that are robust in um, uh, biochemical environments that, that could be relevant to, well, to biological applications, but also potentially for synthetic cells. And this work focuses on using not just regular DNA, naturally occurring uh, DNA, also known as D-DNA, uh, for the purposes of this section, but also the, uh, the chiral mirror uh, LDNA, which is what you get if you, you, if you replace uh, the, the, the sugar in, in the backbone with, with a sugar of opposite chirality. And this work was published uh, last year in EC Synthetic Biology. And the problem is that in biological foods, DNA, D-DNA degrades over time, but LDNA does not. Um, and that's because in uh, large part due to the fact that while well, the nucleases have evolved to recognize D-DNA more readily than, than L-DNA because that's what they actually encounter right, in, in, in the world. And so our goal is to uh, interact with biological molecules using these L-DNA devices, but the problem is they don't like to interact. So uh, if you take a, a D-DNA and, and a complementary L-DNA, they don't like to stick together. The base pairing rules uh, uh, do, do not apply because the choralities are, are, are wrong. Right? So the question is, how can we get around this? And our solution was to develop um, novel uh, hybrid chiral molecules, which contain both LDNA and DDNA. So this is an example of one of these on, on at the top. And if you imagine sort of traveling along this duplex, your kind of um, you know, your, um, your, 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 your twisting in one direction, and at some point it stops and then starts twisting back as you continue. And that's kind of what this image shows here. And so we want to, um, to communicate between these sides so that we can, for example, sense a DDNA molecule and then transmit that signal into our DNA so that we could process it using a robust circuit. And we do that using a process uh, known as heterochiral strand displacement, which is a, essentially an extension of strand displacement, but where you have these opposing chiralities. And so we designed this translator system where the input can be of one chirality and the output, in this case X, the output Y can be of the opposite. Uh, uh, chirality, the blue here. And the interesting thing about this is that this involves a strand displacement reaction that actually crosses this barrier between the two chiralities on a single molecule. Um, and so we were interested to see if that works. And indeed it does. And so this data here shows um, uh, uh, where uh, transmission of uh, a signal from D-DNA input to L-DNA output, um, vice versa from L-DNA input to D-DNA output, and then the homochiral control where it's all D-DNA. And the bottom right here just shows well these things are are, are linear in, in terms of their, their response. So this this thing can work. And this this system, by the way, uh, developed uh, using an elegant uh, design for leakless strand displacement systems based on this two step process by Wang et al., which essentially is 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 a low leak by design because it relies on the formation of this unstable uh, tri molecular complex. So three things have to come together to produce a leak, whereas in the, 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 the system, the, the, the pathway that we want, uh, only two have to come together. And finally, was, is this thing, does this thing resist degradation? Uh, well, yes, it does. So that our hypothesis is, well, DDNA gets chewed up uh, by nucleases, for example, in our hybrid system, say D2L, the D will be chewed up, the L will not. And we sort of see this as, uh, in, in, in a long-term incubation in uh, uh, serum supplement media. Over 26 hours, we see a lot less leak, that is to say, unwanted fluorescence coming out of our uh, D2L system than we did in our D2D system. So this, uh, these uh, systems are robust to, um, to degradation and could therefore be, uh, I guess, utilized as, um, you know, as, as control circuitry for some kind of synthetic cell. Um, I guess just briefly at the very end, and uh, this, is, this is kind of a short one. I wanted to show some things to do with membranes. So this is some work that I'm doing with a grad student, Aurora Fabry-Wood, a few years back on uh, input sensing to encapsulated DNA, uh, DNA components. So this is um, a potential way to get inputs into a, into a DNA-controlled synthetic cell. 
um, and the approach that we took in this work, so it was published a couple of years back, was to uh, to use DNA aptamers uh, to uh, membrane permeable, permeable steroids, such as deoxycorticosterone and cortisol shown here, and encapsulating these in GUVs generated in microfluidics. And so these, these um, um, I wanted some pictures of, of, of vesicles, so here they are to round out the talk. So these, are, these, are, these things are stimulus responsive and, and, and selective, um, and as expected, the the membranes protect the DNA uh, aptamers inside from uh, either from degradation by DNA. So we, 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 in the absence of the membrane, um, the aptamers get chewed up by DNAs or get activated by interfering DNA, whereas in the presence of the bilayers, uh, they, uh, uh, they, they don't. So, so this is just you know, another component building towards a system where we could imagine um, these aptamers, rather than just producing the fluorescent signal as they did here, uh, could actually feed into a, a larger circuit, a strong displacement circuit of the kind um, that I sort of just showed before. Um, and so that's pretty much, I think, all I, all I have time to say. Um, so I guess to conclude, I, I think this is just sort of a, 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 an, an advertisement in, in favor of information processing to build um, interesting behaviors in our in synthetic cells. Uh, an example, um, this particular interesting, at least I think is interesting, is this idea of learning, which is inspired by real biological um, organisms, potentially. And in addition to things like genetic circuits, you know, molecular computing uh, uh, devices using DNA, for example, offer an alternative mechanism to realize some of these behaviors that we can program and control uh, pretty well. And so with that, so with that I'd just like to, to, to finish by acknowledging our collaborators on this work. Um, at, at UNM, uh, uh, Dr. Stefanovic, uh, Steve Graves, Gabriel Lopez, Nick Carroll, and uh, Milan Stanley, Columbia, and uh, uh, members of the group, in particular, the one Tyler Tini, whose work was shown in, in, the, in, the, in the talk, but, but all the others as well, and uh, various funding awards, most, uh, most notably from, from NSF. And so with that, I'd like to uh, uh, thanks, thank you for your attention, and. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Matt. That was a beautiful talk. Um, I invite the audience to uh, write your questions in the Q&A. I do have a question on your uh, simulated learning. Um, how large are your training sets typically for, uh, for getting small loss? Um, you, uh, you mean how many rounds of training do we do? Yeah. Um, so we keep it kind of small. Um, I'm just trying to find here. So for example, here, this is 15 training, 15 rounds of training um, for this one. I think for the earlier ones, I think it was similar, um, mostly because, well, for the, I guess, for the practicalities of, of, of well, in, in simulations, I suppose you, you, you can train for longer, but in, if we were to try and build this thing in, 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 in a real system, right, it would, um, you know, 15 training rounds would be probably, you know, towards the upper end of what we might think about being able to do. Okay, thank you. Um, there is a question in the Q&A now. Um, Gonzalo Nahin Morales Chaya, he asks, um, hello, Dr. Laking, wonderful talk. How is the DNA inversion of chirality induced? Is this process reversible? Um, let me just find the slide here. Um, so we don't, it, 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 we don't sort of reverse the chirality of a particular molecule. It's, um, it's rather this idea of, well, we're, we're changing the set of free strands that are in, this, in, 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 in the solution. So the input to our, our, our translator is, is a free strand of one chirality that gets bound and then triggers this series of reactions that releases a previously bound strand of the opposite chirality to make it free. So, so we're not sort of reconfiguring uh, the molecule. Um, in that sense, we're just consuming one and releasing the other. Okay, one more question uh, by Philippe Bastiens. Um, how would you design a DNA-based NN that can sense complex time varying compositions of chemicals? And it says beautiful work. 
Um, complex time varying compositions of chemical. Um, so I guess you, I guess this is sort of like a time series question, and we haven't really looked sort of so much at that, but um, you, you know, similar, a similar, um, um, I suppose, similar um, architectures might be used, might be used for that as well, where I guess you are, you are sampling periodically. Um, and well, I suppose you could argue that what we do here is kind of doing something like that in the sense that it's sampling a periodical uh, set of inputs. Um, but I, I, I think, yeah, for, for doing something to do with sort of time series or uh, uh, learning or estimation, um, there might be other, uh, so th these algorithms are all based on sort of uh, supervised learning where you give the thing um, the inputs and the output you expect to see, and it has to figure out how to how to how to match that. Um, uh, there are other uh, conceptions of of, of machine learning um, that uh, might be closer to sort of the time series um, um, approach, uh, time series problem that I guess you're asking about. Um, and I, I guess I see no reason why you couldn't do a similar thing for those and implement them in a sort of a some kind of chemical reaction network system in a similar way. Okay, we have uh, more questions by uh, R.P. Oates. Yes, uh, if you think <clears throat> that emergent learning behaviors arise from DNA and wondering if you could comment further on how LDNA and DDNA hybrids might affect such downstream learning behaviors in synthetic cells. Um, um, em emergent, um, Possibly, I mean, I mean, I guess I'm not really sure what what, what is what that means. Um, in terms of um, how they could interact with synthetic cells, I think the the I the sort of the the reason I guess I present present sort of here is is this idea that um, you you know a synthetic cell could be could be different in many ways than a than a a, 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 a living cell and. and you know, a lot of the synthetic cell systems that we that we've seen are based on things like cell-free TXTL systems, for example, where you, know, you essentially have a lot of cellular components uh, in a mix uh, doing something. And if you want to try and uh, start thinking about integrating other uh, control mechanisms in there, like, for example, like a strand displacement one, um, then you start running into this problem uh, potentially of well, the 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 the, the single strand DNA will, will just get eaten up by the by the by the cell by the synthetic cell. So um, how do you how do you interface with that? And the the idea of using LDNA is sort of to I guess to cloak yourself and and, and try and evade detection by those new traces. So the, I guess the idea would be it's more robust in that sense. Uh, one more question by Pasquale Stano. Uh, the route you're exploring is very interesting. In order to obtain lifelike behavior, is it enough to process information or do the system also needs to give meaning to information? Uh, yes. Um, so this all, this all gets quite deep, right? And quite philosophical. Um, and I, I suppose you could argue that by processing information, you are giving meaning to it in some form. And I, I kind of, um, the, the, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of literature on things like um, behavior and learning and even consciousness in various lower organisms and even plants. Um, and you, you have to be very careful what you say and the words that you use. And, and you know, I, I wouldn't say that, you know, I, I wouldn't really think it, it's very sensible to say that, that a stentor is giving meaning to, um, to the information that it processes or the things that it learns, if indeed it does learn things. Um, but, you know, I, I think that the word is helpful because it helps us to conceptualize maybe what's going on, but um, it seems more likely at least sort of to me from a computational perspective that it's more of a form of this is a slightly more um, capable automaton or uh, than we perhaps previously thought that is not just looking at its that is not just operating based on the current state but also has has um, recollection in, in scare quotes of previous states via 
you know, these some some kind of um, representation of those things that, that change its feature behavior. Okay, and um, anonymous attendee asks, can similar process be adapt to protein coding genes like creating antibodies? Um, similar process in terms of the learning process, um, I assume. Um, perhaps, maybe. Um, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, molecular biologists have gotten very good at screening things, right? They're making libraries and screening them um, to find things that they want and, and, and directing evolution to, um, uh, to, to get them where they want to go. Um, and this is, I guess, sort of kind of orthogonal to that in a sense. So, and it's part, it relates partly to the idea of, well, why would you want to do this in a synthetic? Why might you do this in a synthetic cell? One of the reasons being you no longer have, well, you have a lot less ish issue with things like evolution to um, 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 you know, to, to, as, as an alternative explanation to why the behavior is changing. And so I suppose there might be a way to do that, but um, I haven't really, haven't really thought about it. Yeah, and just one more quick question uh, before we move on. So can you use low affinity combinatorial binding to multiple okay. aptamers in the first in input layer to train the network? And the question yeah. is basically if you can have artificial cells interpret signal for by, uh, for which they have no specific sensors. And that's by uh, Philip Bustins. Yeah, so I think this is sort of maybe clarifying the earlier question. So I, I guess I, I see what you mean. Yes, so this is the question that this is the question about sensing, right, which is Yes, how do you, I guess, I guess in a sense, how do you know what to sense for? Um, yeah, I think, yeah, you, you exactly, you could do exactly what, what you say. So in, in the, uh, wherever it's gone here, um, in the neural network kind of imp uh, implementation, the first layer of your thing might be an array of um, 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 somewhat promiscuous, at biosensors, right, that each generate a kind of a unique uh, signature, um, and then you might train the network or the network might learn uh, to interpret those in, in some way. So yes, I, I understand the, the question you mean exactly, you can do that. And some of my colleagues have, have, have looked at such things in terms of Aptimism in particular, um, that's not, that's sort of slightly more their work than mine, but yes, you could definitely. With that, thank you, uh, Matt, thank you. and uh, we'll move on to our last talk of this session. Uh, we'll have, um, it's a, our second 15 minute contributed talk. And as before, you may use the Q&A to ask questions. So we'll have uh, Dr. Alicina Basraf Shan. Um, he's from, um, he was from Emory Un uh, University. He, graduated and who joined Dr. Michelle Wang's uh, lab at Cornell in like in a few weeks. So uh, welcome. And um, he's going to talk about programmable DNA origami motors. Thank you so much. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Uh, as uh, you said, I just defended my PhD and I did my PhD in Emory University uh, Department of Chemistry. Emory University is located in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, here you can see an uh, image of the university and the Atlanta downtown. And that building over there is the Department of Chemistry. And on the fourth floor, it's the Salida Lab where I did most of the research that I'm going to uh, talk about. Um, so uh, we all know that one important aspect of living systems is the ability uh, to convert uh, chemical energy to mechanical motion and biology has uh, evolved many systems to do so. Uh, we just heard examples of the kinesin family and the myosin family walking on um, intracellular cytoskeletons and also RNA and DNA polymerases are nanoscale motors that move along the DNA, uh, which is central. So the goal of my research uh, is to create synthetic analogs of biological motor proteins and nanoscale modules that efficiently convert chemical energy to nanomechanical motion. The main tool that I'm going to use is DNA nanotechnology, and that's uh, basically the information in DNA can be used to assemble nanostructures because always A binds to T and C binds to G. Uh, DNA nanotechnology uh, has been booming in the past decade. This is a, a 
pretty old article, but you can see that by 2013, there's so many papers uh, coming out. So there's a big chunk of knowledge that we can use to build uh, different nanostructures uh, using DNA. And we can use this to create devices and machines that convert uh, chemical energy to mechanical motion. Uh, I want to make a distinct classification of uh, DNA machines that they can be broadly classified into two categories that either they don't produce any mechanical work or they, they are motors and constantly uh, produce mechanical work. The examples of uh, not work producing are DNA switches that with an input, they can go from state one and state two and undo their own work or like diffusional devices that would just diffuse back and forth on a surface. On the other hand, you have the DNA motors that uh, constantly uh, cleave products or cleave fuel and turn it into mechanical motion, such as the example here. You cleave this uh, foothold and move on to the next. And I'm gonna dive a little bit more into this uh, Burns Bridge Brownian ratchet mechanism. Uh, this is a general mechanism and it's uh, used to explain the translocation such as the uh, influence of virus. Uh, if we want to look at it a very abstract way, uh, it works that you have an enzyme leg bound to a body that binds to a surface full of substrates. Upon this binding, the enzyme turns the substrate to a product and this increases the uh, free energy in the system. Uh, it could lead to complete dissociation if it's only one leg and nothing is holding it, but it could also uh, make a step and move forward. So the monopedal meaning that one enzymatic leg can usually take one to five steps before dissociation. You can increase the number of legs to create bipedals such as the kinesin that we saw that was walking. And this increases uh, the number of steps that a single motor can take, but uh, because of the lack of coordination, you might get down slower. And this gets specifically uh, worse if you have many, many DNA legs that while one foot might go forward, the other foot could bind backwards. So there's a trade-off between uh, processivity, meaning the number of uh, steps that a motor can take, and uh, velocity. As you increase the number of legs, uh, a lot of experiments and theory points into this direction that uh, when you increase processivity, you get decreased velocity. An exception to this trade-off was this uh, five micrometer uh, DNA bead that is uh, coated with DNA and it binds to an RNA model layer. When you add RNAsH to the system, RNAsH specifically cleaves RNA bound to the particle, but not RNA anywhere else. And you can see the particles uh, moving. And this uh, ability has been uh, contributed to the ability of this particle to roll. So if we want to look at uh, rolling uh, with an energetic lens, rolling basically coordinates the motion of individual legs. So when you have walking, they are not coordinated and it doesn't take many productive steps, but when you have rolling, it can take uh, uh, productive steps while still being bound to the surface. So it overcomes that trade-off. So if we look at the literature on dynamic DNA motors, uh, motors that either autonomous or non-autonomous uh, can take discrete steps, you have uh, the non-autonomous uh, motors down here and with recent progresses over here. And then you have this outlier, which is the rolling micromotor that can take thousands of steps. If you compare size and the speed, uh, you can see that the unipedal and uh, multipedal DNA walkers are in the same size regime as myosin, dinin, and kinesin, but the rolling micromotors uh, are orders of magnitude larger. So the question that I wanted to answer is that, uh, is the rolling behavior scalable down uh, to the nanoscale? So uh, the main hypothesis that I had is that if we could make motors with DNA origami, DNA origami enables us to test uh, different uh, nanostructures uh, for motor function. And uh, luckily for us, we had experts in DNA origami design in uh, Emory and Georgia Tech campus. And you can see here that with DNA origami, you can create basically any 3D nanostructure here. I'm showing a rabbit as an example, but uh, we wanted to make motors. So the structure that we designed is a 16 helix bundle DNA rod. 
on each side of this DNA rod on the four sides, four long sides of it, we put individual positions for DNA legs and we know exactly which, uh, where each individual DNA legs are. I made a RNA surface coated uh, on a glass slide. And when you add these motors to this RNA surface, RNA and DNA bind, and the branch bridge uh, mechanism is engineered when you add RNAs H and that specifically cleaves RNA that is bound to the DNA. So RNA binds to DNA legs and then RNA gets cleaved, the motor is high energy and then it can take a step forward uh, to the right. And because of this anisotropic shape, we hypothesize that if it's rolling, it should move on a straight line. With TEM, we confirm the structure design and the mean uh, width is 130 nanometers. And uh, we also put uh, Alexa Floor 647 cargo DNA on the sides to both enable visualization and show cargo transport by these motors. So the raw data or the videos look like this. You can see the white spots that are the Alexa 647 origami motors and the red aside three fuel. You can see that they are moving uh, micron distances within this hour. I can uh, track individual motor behavior with the video you're seeing here. Um, this uh, video shows individual localizations on this uh, video to the left and each point in this colored plot is the center of the maximum peak of uh, an individual motor. So I can track uh, individual motors in real time and this gives me a quantitative readout of ensemble motor behavior because I can do this for many, many motors. Uh, here you can see a video of Alexa Floor 647 motors moving. Um, on the right you see uh, with the addition of RNAs H, uh, this is around 35 motors. And on the further right you can see without RNAs H. So this shows that motion is definitely RNAs H dependent. And we have a quantitative readout of ensemble motor behavior. And this shows that motors move with an average velocity of 40 nanometers per minute, which was the fastest reported to that date. Uh, the other side of my data is the fuel consumption. We have a uh, side three labeled fuel and you can see these tiny depletion tracks uh, in the wake of motor moving. I can do super res imaging with SIM and I measured the track width. And as you can see, the track width is about 133 uh, nanometers. So if you remember, the long axis of my DNA origami rod was 130, 30, 130 nanometers, I'm sorry. Uh, which what this suggests is that the motion direction is orthogonal to the long axis of this motor, which suggests uh, that these motors are moving with a rolling mechanism. So uh, right now we have a really good system. We have control over structure with DNA origami design, and we can read out the performance with fluorescent microscopy in terms of trajectory analysis, meaning tracking individual motors and fuel consumption analysis, meaning to see what's left in the wake of it. So with this system, I experimentally tested uh, different variables to uh, find out what, is, what are the design principles for rapid and unidirectional motion. I tested the ability to roll by creating a, a geometric distribution library. And here you can see the only uh, motor that moves significant distances with the four sides, meaning that rolling is um, uh, definitely required for this rapid and directional motion. Uh, we have uh, tested um, basically flexibility of the chassis to see if rolling requires a rigid chassis. We measured uh, rigidity by TEM with this theta when we take out single strands from the 16 helix bundle design. And we can see that the net displacement significantly decreases when you have single stranded regions within the chassis. And lastly, we wanted to test the effect of DNA like density and polyvalency. We see that with increased DNA like density, we get increased motor displacements. And we also create another mutant that has lower polyvalency, but the same density, and these go just as fast. So that means DNA like density is a critical factor. So uh, just a brief summary uh, of this part is that we use DNA origami technique to systematically test structure functional relationships at the nanoscale. And through that, we uncovered design principles for unidirectional and fast motion. 
the unidirectional motion requires this anisotropic chassis with a symmetric distribution of DNA legs. We need rigidity for rolling to happen. And otherwise we saw that they don't coordinate. And we saw that the higher leg density gives higher velocity and processivity. And this resulted in the fastest and most processive DNA nanoscale motor to that date. But uh, uh, we, we still thought that there's still some room for improvement. Although it is the fastest synthetically made, it's still much slower than the biological motors. Uh, my data showed that further increasing DNA like density leads to faster and more processive motion. And the other thing was that we're tracking these motors with fluorescence and that uh, leads to a low photon budget and I wanted to like really see what are individual motor steps and DNA gold nanoparticles were uh, structures that really address these two limitations uh, because of the thiolated uh, gold bond is labeled we can pack much denser up to seven times denser DNA on individual uh, uh, gold particles I use the same surface and the same DNA legs here in addition the gold core scatters light which means that I can uh, basically see these particles with white light. So here I'm going to show you a video of these particles on a surface in the presence of RNAs H. This is with white light and no fluorescence and I can track these 15 nanometer particles uh, based on this uh, dark scattering puncta uh, that you see here. And here is how the tracking looks like. You have the RACM video and this is the live tracking and the fluorescence images show the final point. The DNA legs here are labeled with FAM and you can see the localization of the depletion track and the particle tracking match perfectly. And when you do the analysis for ensemble after multiple lines of uh, optimization, you can see that these motors are really fast and travel micrometer distances within this 30 minute window by tracking individual motor steps, we also saw that they can reach uh, 50 nanometer per second steps. So kind of a, a bigger summary and conclusion. Uh, we saw that uh, over the years, uh, motors are taking faster and faster steps. And I just added uh, an, an equals three for rolling motors. And on the right, you can see that we are getting closer to our goal of recapitulating the properties of myosin denaine in terms of size and speed uh, with this two work here. And in terms of outlook, we can look at the different design uh, handles and parameters that we have for this kind of BBR polyvalent motor design. Uh, in my PhD, I've only focused on the hub by testing different structures and testing different DNA densities. But uh, as we saw in the previous talks, you can also engineer uh, different tracks on DNA scaffolds and that's gonna help to put them in synthetic cells. And also we can engineer uh, different uh, motors with different fuels. Right now we've only explored one enzyme but you could think about different enzymes or DNA enzymes and strand displacement. And I think all this knowledge come together. The future of this field is gonna be uh, really, really exciting. And on that note, I wanted to thank you for your attention and also the people in our lab. Uh, we're a big lab and my advisor, Kala Talaida, uh, really supportive of this research. I want to thank the members of DNA Motor subgroup and uh, my dear collaborators uh, who helped with DNA origami design and uh, the modeling of BBR motors. And I'm happy to answer any questions. I think I finished on time. Yeah. Yes, you, uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, we have time for some questions. Uh, here in the Q&A, we have an anonymous attendee asking if you're, um, they're wondering if you can manipulate the speed of the motion by increasing the temperature, pH, or osmotic pressure. Yes, great question. Uh, so in the experiments that I've done, uh, we know that pH definitely affects RNAs H uh, catalysis. So uh, optimal enzyme uh, turnover is at pH 8. So that's the pH that we use. It's also uh, very dependent on the magnesium concentration due to the K on of the DNA leg to the RNA fuel and the K off that follows. So yes, you can tune it with uh, the osmotic pressure and the salt concentration, ionic strength, pH. Yeah. So from your images, it looks like you're starting everything in the center and then all your motors go in different directions. And so, um, mm -hmm. yeah, is, it a, is there a way to um, 
engineer uh, so that they can they all take the same track, for instance, like a like a directed motion to us to a particular point. Yes, so uh, these mo motors, uh, firstly, I want to say that uh, these are just plotted from the center. They start from different points on the surface. But yes, the motion, we don't control the direction. If they start on uh, some direction, they go there. Uh, we can pattern the track. And we've shown that with the microparticles that on a pattern track, you can control the directions because they're going to follow uh, fuel sites. Okay. Um, any more questions? We have one more minute if anybody's typing. Um, okay, well, thank you very much for your talk. It was a really interesting work. Good luck in your uh, new position. And um, with this, we finished the second session of uh, the first day of talks. And I uh, want to thank you. Thank all the presenters and the audience for joining us. Uh, the next session will start in about 10 minutes. Uh, it'll be a poster discussion that will be moderated by Jacqueline Delora and Gabriel Lopez. And um, this session will be in a different Zoom link that you can find here in the chat for, for this Zoom and, or on our website. So uh, that link will have a waiting room and the host will let you in shortly after you log in. Um, and now we're going to go on a short break. Thank you all and, th and enjoy the rest of our conference. Thank you.